That sounds even better. We'll go ahead and call the RTC meeting for March 7th to order. And can we begin with the roll call, please? Commissioner Rodkin. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Commissioner Bertrand. Here. Commissioner Leopold. Here. Commissioner Bator. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Coonerty. Here. Commissioner Alternate Mulhern. Here. Commissioner Alternate Gregorio. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. And, and Commissioner Lowe. Thank you for that. Okay, we're gonna begin with the review of items uh, discussed in closed sessions, and before I uh, let the, give a, a preview of that, just let the people in the audience know we don't have access to our private room, so we'll be holding the first closed session here. So once we begin it, we'll ask you to leave the room, and then we'll bring you back afterwards. So can we have a preview of what's in closed session? Sorry about that. Um, yes, we have two items in closed session. The first is a conference with legal counsel um, relating to initiation of litigation. The second is a conference with legal counsel relating to significant exposure to litigation. There's one case um, under each item, and we do expect um, potentially reportable action. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address us on anything to be discussed in closed session? Seeing none, we'll adjourn to closed session. We'll ask you to uh, quietly clear the room and we'll be back uh, in a few minutes. We'll go ahead and continue with the meeting. Uh, I, I want to thank the public for uh, clearing the room for us and coming back so we can proceed. Um, do we have a report out on closed session? Yes, we do. We need to report that um, litigation has been authorized and um, it was by a unanimous vote. And the further information as required by Government Code Section 54957.1 will be provided. Great. Thank you for that report. Okay, we have a, a public hearing scheduled at 9.30, so I'm gonna jump around a little bit on the agenda so we can accommodate that in a timely manner. So um, I think uh, we might have time to get into consent calendar. So I'm gonna jump to the consent calendar right now and see if there's any, uh, anybody that wants to pull anything, anybody in the commission wants to pull anything from the consent account calendar? Um, there's some uh, additions in, uh, to the agenda that I, I need to go through real quickly. Let's, let's go to that first then. Um, uh, I, Item eight, which is on consent, there's a uh, revised, uh, there, there are replacement pages, which includes a revised staff report and resolution. Um, uh, uh, since you've had very little time to look at this, um, um, I wanted to uh, inform you that um, uh, Santa Cruz Metro has made a last minute proposal to allow um, all of the funding this year to go to uh, uh, community bridges and lift line for um, LC top funds. Uh, they did request that in future years that we uh, um, divide out in perpetuity a, a percentage share of, of certain funds that we had not had time to look at. Um, but we believe that um, in the spirit of cooperation, we should move forward with uh, today's recommendation. And hey, uh, I'm to gonna do is I'm gonna pull that That's myself, right. okay, okay, and have you expand on that. And we'll, uh, we'll do that after the uh, public hearing. So I'm looking for any other items on the consent agenda if anybody wants to pull me. Okay, and, and additional handouts on item 20. There's a handout. Um, there's a handout for item 23, including a rata to the final EIR. 
There's also comments received between February 27th and March 6th on item 23, and also a handout for um, item 24, which is the county's report. And that's the only changes in the agenda. Great, thank you for that update, appreciate that. Okay, and now I'm looking for the commissions. Anybody wanna pull anything on the consent agenda? Anyone from the public like to pull anything from the consent agenda? I'll bring it back for a motion. I would move the consent agenda as amended. Second. Okay. A motion and a second to a moon, uh, for the consent agenda, uh, excluding item eight, which we'll discuss later. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Okay, with that, I think we'll move into the public hearing. Uh, we can go ahead and start with the presentation on that. This will be... This is a public hearing on the consideration of the cert certification of the final environmental impact report for the proposed North Coast Rail Trail project and selection of the proposed project coastal side as the preferred alternative. And we have uh, Corey Coletti, Senior Transportation Planner. Welcome, Corey. Yeah. Thank you, commissioners. Um, thank you, members of the public. Um, we are here to present to you um, Sorry. This isn't moving back. You want it back or? Yes, um, th at the beginning. Always good to start at the beginning. communications till after the public hearing because it's important to get the public hearing on time. Yeah. No, at the very beginning, the first slide. Sorry, my computer, I can't. <clears throat> and I will, um, why don't I just will ask uh, you to advance the slides um, if that be, if that would work. So very first slide. So I'll just get started. Um, so we are here to present the North Coast Rail Trail Sorry. Environmental Impact Report. Um, and uh, before you, the consideration is the staff recommendation. And the staff recommendation is that you consider certifying the final environmental impact report as being compliant with the California Environmental Quality Act. So that's CEQA. And um, environmental impact report is EIR. Um, and um, select the proposed project, which is the trail on the coastal side, as the preferred alignment. Um, we recommend that you adopt the CEQA findings and the statement of overriding considerations, and you adopt the mitigation, monitoring, and reporting program. Uh, before that, however, we have a detailed presentation for you with a lot of information, so um, we appreciate your patience. And we will also be addressing the um, errata handout that um, has been provided to you that contains references to minor changes. So um, a second slide, please. That's the second slide, I think. Um, second slide. I can't see, so you're gonna have to tell me if that's the right slide. Very beginning. May I suggest, uh, Corey, you could sit here and have the keyboard and advance uh, you. as you go along. Thank you, thank you. John Leopold, our IT department. There we go. <laughs> well done. <laughs> it's a common practice at board meetings. Okay. Get comfortable because it's a long presentation. 
It is. You won't even have to stand. So um, the presentation outline, um, I'll start with that, and we'll do. Is the green light? Am I on? No, I think you were on before. Yes, I was on before. You should, you should probably get, get closer to the mic as well. Okay. okay <laughs> um, so I'll introduce the project team. There are a lot of team members here today, and it's a complicated project with a lot of partner stakeholders and lead agency, implementing agencies. So I'll go over that, provide a project overview for you. Um, then we will go over the environmental review process, the public engagement that we've sought um, thus far, and provide a summary of the final EIR. Um, following the presentation, we'd like to get your um, questions answered, and then we ask that you open the public hearing. Um, following the public hearing, um, you would close the public hearing, and then you will be deliberating and considering the staff recommendation. Um, so I, Corey Coletti, I'm your program manager for the rail trail. Um, Grace Blakesley, senior transportation planner, and your directors, deputy director and executive director, um, have all provided extensive review and assistance in the development of the EIR. Um, FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, their Central Federal Lands Division is the actual entity that is delivering the project. Um, the reason that that is the case is because we uh, we acquired a grant. Um, we were successful in receiving a $6.3 million grant through the Federal Lands Access Program. And the way that that program works is that the, the federal entity actually delivers the project. Um, the, you see the names of the pro project manager the environmental specialist and design engineer. They are not here today, but um, that we worked very closely with them to develop the design um, that formed the basis of the project descriptions. Rincon Consultants and Harris and Associates, uh, Associates teamed up to produce the EIR. So you will be hearing next from Kate Giberson and Megan Jones. Um, they will pre present the EIR itself. And then uh, we have representatives from Ecosystems West. Um, Aaron McGinty and Justin Davila are here. Um, Kim Lee Horn is um, the transportation and traffic subconsultant, and Pacific Crest Engineering um, provided the geology analysis. Um, and finally, we have our legal team, uh, Jim Moose from um, Remy Moose Manley and Brooke Miller, um, who provided guidance and legal oversight as we developed the EIR. We wanted to ensure robust mitigation measures, um, and they assisted us with that. So for background and context for new commissioners and members of the public who are unfamiliar uh, with this project, uh, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network is um, the, the trail project that we're talking about right now is, is a part of that network. And the entire network has as the spine the Coastal Rail Trail, which goes um, adjacent to the existing uh, rail tracks. Um, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Master Plan and Programmatic EIR was, were completed, adopted, and certified in 2013. Um, we identified 20 trail segments in that master plan, and um, several of those segments are in various stages of development with the City of Santa Cruz um, segment scheduled to break ground. Um, later this year. Um, also through the um, voter approved measure D, um, sales tax measure, uh, 120 million will, uh, um, this project will receive uh, approximately 120 million over the 30 years of the sales tax measure. <coughs> The proposed project is um, a portion of segment five uh, as identified in the master plan. It goes from Davenport to Wilder Ranch. Um, it's 7.5 miles long. It includes a 20 foot wide um, path. 12 feet of that is paved, eight feet of that is unpaved. 
and we have parking improvements um, at three parking lots, one at Yellow Bank, Panther Beach, um, one at Bonnie Doon that basically uh, provides connectivity from the existing Bonnie Doon parking lot to the future trail, and then one parking lot in Davenport. The project also includes restrooms, trash cans, um, recycling receptacles, and uh, crossing in Davenport. Um, a lot of these amenities are to support the trail, but there are also good planning, which um, aims to address some of the needs on the North Coast to complement the trail project. Um, like I said, the trail alignment is a rail with trail, with the, tra the proposed project being on the coastal side. Um, I identified the federal funding that we received. We also received local funding. Um, this commission uh, committed $5 million in Measure D funding through the five-year allocation process. Um, we also received funding from some of our stakeholders and funding partners, namely the California Coastal Conservancy, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County committed uh, approximately $4 million, um, State Parks, Coastal Commission, and County of Santa Cruz, their stakeholders, they're not funding, funding um, uh, entities in that they're not providing funding, um, but they are providing significant staff resources and support. We have yet to secure funding for the portion that we're calling phase two, um, and that is a portion um, that's two miles long from Yellow Bank Panther Beach to Davenport, and it includes the three parking lots. So we still have to secure funding for construction of those elements. We have enough funding to be doing the environmental um, clearance process and the design, uh, but before we go into construction, we will need to secure that funding. You can see a map here of the, the proposed trail, which is in red, and in pink you will see the City of Santa Cruz um, trail project that's due to go to construction. Um, in blue you see the existing Wilder Ranch uh, path and the existing West Cliff Drive path, and all of that is to show the, the connectivity of the current project and the extra added value that um, it will provide given the tie-in to all the other projects that are in the works or existing. Um, so in terms of the environmental review process, um, a full environmental impact report was not required for this project, but the RTC nonetheless chose um, to um, to produce one in order to evaluate project impacts, consider alternatives, and provide the opportunity for um, extensive public engagement as per CEQA, um, as per CEQA law. Um, Kate Giberson will go through the EIR development process, and she and Megan Joan will, Jones will provide a summary of the draft EIR, uh, described project alternatives, summarize comments that we received on the draft EIR, and the master responses to key topic areas that we developed um, to those comments. Um, and included in that will be um, the, the finding in the EIR that the proposed project is the environmentally superior project and how the I EIR came to that um, determination. And then at the end, I will go over next steps that we need to complete in order to deliver this project within the time frame that we um, we have allocated. So with that, I would like Kate Giberson to come up and continue. Sure. I have a copy right here. Um, hi, I'm Kate. Um, I'm going to review the CEQA process and where we are and give you a summary of the draft EIR and final EIR. Um, the purpose of CEQA uh, is so that the decision makers can make an informed decision. We disclose the potential environmental impacts and identify mitigation measures. It also provides the public with an opportunity to weigh in on the process and uh, encourages interagency communication. Next slide. There we go. Sorry, I forgot to 
prompt you. Um, so the EIR process begins by issuing a notice of preparation or an NOP for a 30-day review period whereby the public and agencies can uh, provide input on the issues that are going to be evaluated in the EIR and the alternatives that uh, should be considered as, uh, as well. The input received during that 30-day period included requests to evaluate a trail only alternative, which the RTC had already committed to doing at an equal level of detail, that's alternative mm -hmm. one. And then a new alternative came in um, by the North Coast Farmers to, um, uh, to have another alternative and the uh, e RTC agreed to evaluate that as well in the EIR. So after preparation of the draft EIR was complete, it was circulated for a 45-day public review period. Um, where the public had an opportunity to review it and provide comments. The notice of availability for the EIR was distributed widely. It uh, was published in the Santa Cruz Sentinel. Uh, it was posted at five different locations along the alignment, and it was distributed to over a 1,000 different agencies, uh, organizations, and interested parties. After the 45-day review period closed on September 24th, uh, RTC began reviewing the comments and developing the responses for the final EIR. The final EIR includes the comments, responses to the comments, and any revisions to the draft EIR. And um, although it wasn't required by CEQA, the RTC um, distributed the final EIR for review four weeks prior to this meeting. Next slide. So the purpose of today's meeting uh, is to receive comments on the final EIR and the merits of the project. It's to certify the EIR and to make a decision on the project. Next slide. This is going to be a pretty high level summary. It's a thick document, as you know. Um, next slide. Uh, so in addition to the proposed project, uh, CEQA requires the lead agency to consider project alternatives that are feasible, meet most of the project objectives, and reduce project impacts. So the proposed project puts the trail on the coastal side of the railroad tracks. Alternative one, trail only, removes the railroad tracks and puts the trail on the rail bed. Alternative two, inland side, puts the trail on the inland side of the tracks. Alternative three, farmer's alternative, the northern portion is the same as alternative one trail only, and the southern portion is outside the rail corridor and along highway one. And finally, there's alternative four, which is the no project alternative, which is a requirement by CEQA that that be analyzed. And al although there's uh, differences in the trail alignment, uh, the trail features um, are, are the same for all for the proposed project and alternatives one, two, and three. So the parking improvements and the different features like restrooms and trash collection and rest stops are all the same. Uh, the RTC decided to evaluate the trail only or alternative one at the same level of detail as the pros proposed project due to the public interest expressed prior to the NOP being issued. And therefore the CFL conducted additional design work to elevate that alternative so that it could be analyzed at an equal level of detail. Alternatives two, three, and four are analyzed in lesser detail in comparison to the proposed project in accordance with the CEQA guidelines. Uh, it should be noted though that because alternative three, the northern half is the same as trail only, obviously that had the additional detail as well for that. Next slide. The um, in CEQA requires that all these different environmental topics be analyzed. I won't read them, but give you a moment to peruse them. And the environmental impact analysis itself, the potential impacts for each environmental topic are based on a series of questions presented in the CEQA guidelines. And the thresholds for determining whether an impact is significant or less than significant is based on the CEQA guidelines, regulations, and industry standards. And a potentially significant impact can be reduced to a less than significant level with mitigation. Next slide. So for each potential impact identified, one of these determinations was assigned to it. Uh, less than significant means it was below the significance threshold without mitigation. Less than significant with mitigation means mitigation was required to get it down to a less than significant level. And significant and unavoidable means it can't be reduced to a less than significant level even with mitigation. Next. So most of the 65 impacts identified, the potentially significant impacts identified, um, are similar 
almost the very similar for the proposed project in alternatives one, two, and three. And most of them are less than significant or can be reduced to less than significant with mitigation. There would be a significant and unavoidable cumulative traffic impact for the proposed project and alternatives one, two, and three. And the cumulative, tra there's traffic generated because people are gonna drive up, park, and use the facility. And the cumulative traffic is the combined traffic from both this project and other reasonably foreseeable projects in the future. And that could not be mitigated to a less than significant level. Additionally, there was another significant unavoidable impact for alternatives one and three, which involve the trail only, and that's the impact to cultural resources. Um, because of the historic uh, designation for the uh, railroad, and, and Megan's gonna talk a little bit more about those uh, impacts. Next slide. So of all those different uh, environmental topics, we, we identified or considered um, these six to be uh, key topics, and that's just based on the project objectives, the historic and current land uses out there, and the natural resources in the area. Um, as mentioned, the impacts to these resources would be similar for the proposed project in alternatives one, two, and three, but there are uh, different impact determinations for agricultural resources and cultural resources, so we're gonna focus on those uh, for this presentation, as well as touch on biological resources and transportation. And Megan's gonna talk a little bit about that, and then I'll be back. Thank you, Kate. Again, I'm Megan Jones with Rincon Consultants, and I'm gonna summarize some of the key environmental um, issue areas. So first, for agricultural resources, one of the main things we look at under CEQA is the conversion of what's called important farmland, uh, which is designated um, in a mapping program from the Department of Conservation called the Farmland Mapping and Monitoring Program. Um, under that program, there's three map definitions um, that sort of constitute important farmland. That includes prime farmland, unique farmland, and farmland of statewide importance. So we did a mapping exercise to determine how much of this important farmland would be converted um, from agriculture to non-agricultural use as a result of the project. Um, that showed that ultimately there would be between seven and 7.6 acres of important farmland. Um, this amount of conversion is not considered substantial. Um, that's in part because the farmland mapping and monitoring program itself cannot even map below 10 acres, so that was sort of a, a threshold that we looked at. Uh, we also looked at the linear nature of the project so that these acreages are not in one specific area, they're, they're distributed throughout the, the project corridor. Um, in addition, a lot of that mapping um, program, it's, it's not an exact science, and so there's important farmland designated in areas that are not currently actively farmed. There's even, you know, portions of that are on the rail line itself. So when we looked at what areas are actively farmed, the acreage were reduced to between 1.4 and 1.5 acres that are actively farmed that are considered important farmland. So that is what would be ultimately converted as a result of the project. Um, because that's not a substantial amount, that was determined to be a less than significant impact under CEQA. Um, However, given the importance of the mitigation of the impact or issue area, um, we did identify an optional mitigation measure, um, AG-1, which if implemented would uh, set aside 1.4 acres of important farmland elsewhere through conservation easements, deed restrictions, or an in-lieu fee. Uh, next slide. Uh, so also related to agricultural resources, um, we looked at the co potential conflicts between the trail and the trail users and agriculture. So there's sort of two sides of the coin here. Um, so on one side, we looked at impacts of the trail construction and trail users on agriculture. And then on the other side, we looked at impacts of agricultural activities on trail users. Um, so on the first side here at the top, um, we looked at impacts during construction, that there could be conflicts depending on where construction is staged or the timing of that. Um, once operational, there could be impacts through uh, trespassing, littering, or through dogs or human waste. Um, dogs, of course, are prohibited on the trail, but we acknowledge that there's a likelihood that some people will ignore such restrictions, and so dogs could be on the trail. Um, so these conflicts will be a challenge um, and a nuisance for agricultural operators, but would not directly convert agriculture, which again is what we're ultimately looking at under CEQA. Um, nevertheless, to limit these effects, there are a variety of mitigation measures required. Um, these are sort of listed on the slide here, which I unfortunately can't see real well myself, but um, they include placing staging areas to avoid agricultural operations and timing construction to avoid peak periods, peak harvest periods if possible, so that's during construction. Uh, regularly removing solid waste and litter. Um, in the final EIR, we added specifically human waste to that, although I think that was implicit, now that's, that is mentioned. Uh, and installing interpretive exhi exhibits to educate users about the importance 
of agriculture to the culture and economy of the area um, and about the need for certain types of activities. So they're aware of those, those kind of active activities. Um, and with that, that impact was determined to be less than significant with the mitigation. Um, on the other side of the coin is the trail users going through active agricultural areas and how they may be impacted primarily through things like pesticide exposure. Um, we determined that if people stay on the trail and pesticides are applied in accordance with the pesticide use labels and applicable regulations, that exposure would be somewhat limited, but we do acknowledge that some people could still trespass, there could still be opportunities for people to be exposed. Um, so we identify that as a potential impact of the project. Mitigation includes installing warning signs, making sure people are aware of those, those hazards. Um, and then we also have a measure in there for establishing a notification procedure. So the RTC would work with the Agricultural Commission to, Commissioner to identify what we're calling um, pesticides of primary concern. So it's a list of sort of the, the worst pesticides. So it's not every pesticide used. And then when those are applied, the uh, agricultural operators would need to notify the trail manager 24 hours in advance. And so the trail manager would go out and then install more signage um, so that it would be very obvious that um, active pesticide spraying is happening. Um, we also, in a response to comments, added an additional measure. So with those measures, we identified that that would be a significant but mitigable impact, so reduced to less than significant. Um, but in the responses to comments, we added some further information about pesticides and health hazards related to that and added a recommended mitigation measure, um, which is HAZ-1, which would direct state parks um, to amend agricultural leases to include provisions that would limit, limit some pesticide spraying. Next slide. Uh, so cultural resources in CEQA looks at a variety of issues, but here I'm gonna focus on historical resources. So you're talking about typically where you're looking at buildings that are you know, architecturally significant or tied with some historical event. Um, in this case, the Davenport branch line itself was determined to be a historical resource under CEQA, and I will explain why that determination was made. Um, the line was developed between 1905 and 1907 to transport freight from the Davenport cement plant, which ultimately provided cement for a variety of significant projects, including the Golden Gate Bridge, the Pan Canal and rebuilding of San Francisco after the 1906 quake. Uh, it also included a unique construction method that was characteristic of the early 20th century. So the historians that looked at this identified that um, this was a potentially significant resource. Um, they also looked at maintenance over time, which had been in kind, so a similar type of, of materials that did not result in, and I'm gonna look at my notes here because these are like specific terms and I'm not a historian, but they would not result in a loss of integrity. Um, the trail or the, the rail line has retained its original alignment, grading, and many other features such as the earthen embankments. It also retains integrity of location, design, setting, workmanship, feeling, and association association, which are all things that the historians look at. Um, because of that, they determined that it was eligible for listing as a national and a California historic resource, as well as a county uh, landmark. So I should reiterate, it's eligible. It has not actually been designated. That's a process to actually get formally designated. But because it's eligible for the purposes of CEQA, it is a, his, um, a historical resources for the EIR. Um, so the project would impact this, although the proposed project would be on the coastal side and wouldn't really touch the tracks. It would introduce a modern element um, and so it would change some of that setting. So that was determined to be a potential impact to the resource. So there's mitigation um, to install interpretive exhibits to explain the history and the engineering to, to educate the community about the importance of that historic resource. And with that, that impact was determined to be less than significant after that mitigation. Um, and I should mention that in contrast, alternatives one and three, which would fully remove the rail line or at least about half of it, would result in a significant unavoidable uh, impact to this particular issue area. And that's pretty much because if you're removing the resource, there's additional mitigation measures that we identify, but ultimately you cannot mitigate such a removal. Next slide. Um, so on biological resources, um, if you looked at that section, you saw that it's very long and lengthy and detailed and robust. Um, so I'm not gonna get into too much detail. It's definitely a high level non-biologist summary, um, but I wanna reiterate that we have the biologists from Ecosystems West in the room um, who would be happy to answer specific questions on biological resources. Uh, but from a summary perspective, um, there's impacts to a variety of specific um, species that we look at, habitat types, um, and then a whole suite of mitigation measures to reduce those impacts. So the mitigation measures primarily include um, 
and I flick the slide here, um, minimizing construction activities in sensitive areas, so avoiding some areas where that's possible, conducting surveys before construction, um, and then doing construction monitoring to make sure that those, those are avoided during construction, compensating for the loss of wetlands, and then developing a project-specific biological resources management plan. Next slide, Corey. Um, and then the last issue I'm gonna touch on is um, transportation and traffic. There's two, two separate impacts under this that I'm gonna talk about. And again, I'll reiterate, I'm not a traffic engineer, um, so I'll give a summary, but um, Frederick Ventner with Kimley Horn, who conducted the analysis, is also here today to answer specific transportation questions. Um, so the, the first issue has to do with really safety hazards. Um, so the project would cross a number of public roads and agricultural access roads, and then of course includes a proposed um, improvements to the crossing of Highway 1. So we looked at the potential hazards of having trail users, you know, interacting with vehicles and ag equipment, um, which could be a potential safety hazard. So the traffic engineers identified some mitigation measures that were specific, design features, signage, that sort of a thing, to make sure that those crossings were safe. Um, and then related to the Davenport crossing, although a lot of those improvements are ultimately um, an improvement to safety, the project includes improvements to the northern half of the existing lot, which we're calling the Davenport lot north, um, but not the south. And so there was a concern that some people who are parking in the southern part that hasn't been formalized may not have much motivation to walk a little ways to the formal crossing. And so there's mitigation um, to encourage that. So basically to encourage people to use the formalized safer crossing. Uh, and with those measures, it was determined that the safety impact would be less than significant with mitigation. Next slide. Um, and then the last one is, as Kate alluded to a little bit, the project would result in some vehicle trips, um, and that's largely because of the parking areas and the fact that this is a little bit outside the city, and we acknowledge that people would drive to some of these parking lots to use the trail. Uh, so Kimley Horn did a traffic impact analysis that looked at how many trips would be uh, generated and ultimately it would be about 300 daily and 150 peak hours. So that's in your morning and evening commute times. Um, when added to existing traffic levels, that was not enough to result in an impact. Um, but of course in CEQA we look at cumulative. So in addition to looking at the existing traffic scenario, we looked at 2035, 2040 based on modeling. You all are probably very familiar with this, but for the, the public. Um, so we look at modeling that that includes all the anticipated development in the area and just the general growth and, and anticipated projects. Um, so we see what traffic will look like in 2040 and 2035 as well. Um, and then we add the project traffic on top of that. So when we performed that analysis, um, basically the cumulative scenario even without the project was bad. Um, so Caltrans um, thresholds or level of service, or right now we look at level of service or LOS, um, the condition without the project would be LOSF, which intuitively is bad. Um, um, that's that's the worst. So and because these are Caltrans facilities we're looking at, we do use their threshold, and essentially if you add one vehicle trip to a, a level of service F, that's a significant impact. Um, so it's a significant impact really without the project, and then you add some trips to it, that's now significant, unavoidable, um, ultimately because there is no way to completely eliminate all trips. I feel like I fumbled that a little bit, but if there's questions, I can I can clarify. And with that, I'll pass it back to Kate. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the project alternatives. Um, as I described earlier, the uh, sequel requires that the lead agency identify and consider project alternatives, and these four that I already talked about and are listed up there uh, were evaluated in the EIR. And as mentioned overall, the impacts of alternatives one, two, and three are generally the same as the proposed project. Uh, some a little less, some a little more, but the impact determinations are mostly the same. The primary difference is with respect to agricultural resources and cultural resources, which Megan elaborated on a little bit. Alternatives one and three, the trail only would have less impact to agricultural resources than the proposed project, but more impact to cultural resources due to the removal of the line. Next one. CEQA also requires that um, the EIR identify an environmentally superior alternative that is not the no project alternative. And so because the impacts were so similar, there's no clear environmentally superior alternative. So we employed a couple of different methods to try to suss that out. Next slide. This is a, 
difficult table to read, but I, I wanted to show you because this is a snapshot of the tool that we use to identify an environmentally superior alternative. It's table 5-5 from the draft EIR. And um, so for example, on the far left column, that's for air quality. The air quality impact for the proposed project is less than significant. The impact for alternative one, the next column over, would be similar and less than significant, but slightly less for construction-related impacts because there's less excavation required and there's increased distance between construction activities and sensitive receptors such as residents. Um, so for this particular topic, um, alternative one was determined environmentally superior. So we did this for each of the topics. And, um, and then the rationale is explained in the text of the, of the table. We also developed a numeric measure whereby the overall impact determination for each topic was given a number. Um, one for less than significant, two for less than significant with mitigation, and three for significant and unavoidable. So therefore, the higher the number, the higher the level of impact. And when we totaled them all up, it again demonstrated how similar all the impacts are, uh, with a total of 27 points for the proposed project in alternative two and 28 points for alternatives one and three. So obviously, the significant and unavoidable nature of one and three kicked it up uh, a point. Um, we then used um, three, with this information on hand in this table, we then used three different measures to try to identify an environmentally superior alternative based on this information. Next slide. So the first uh, measure we used was looking at what was environmentally superior for most of those 16 topics. And when you go through the table and add them up, there was a tie. With the proposed project and alternative one uh, were both superior for seven of the topics. When you go, the, so then we looked at the next uh, next measure, a uh, next method um, was to look at the environmentally superior for just those six key topics that we had identified. And of those six topics, the proposed project is superior for four of them, those being aesthetics, biological resources, cultural resources, and recreation. And alternative one uh, was superior for two topics, uh, agricultural resources and transportation. And then the third measure we used to flush this out was looking specifically at which ones resulted in significant and unavoidable impacts. And as we've already discussed, um, neither the proposed project nor alternative two. So when you look at all three together, as you can see, the proposed project was superior using all these three methods, and thus that is why it was identified as the environmentally superior alternative for purposes of this EIR. Next slide. I'm going to go into the final EIR. Um, after the 45-day public review period ended on September 24th, the RTC reviewed the comments received, developed responses to each comment, and made appropriate revisions to the draft EIR for clarification and additional detail. So the final EIR, again, is comprised of the comments on the draft EIR, responses to those comments, and the revised draft EIR. Next slide. So the comments received on the draft EIR um, of the written, we received written comments from 10 public agencies, 11 organizations and businesses, and 46 individuals. There were also two public hearings held during the uh, review period for the draft EIR, one in Santa Cruz and one in Davenport, and uh, the combined uh, comments from there were seven individuals spoke. Next slide. This is just listing the 10 public agencies that provided comments. California Coastal Commission, Coastal Conservancy, Fish and Wildlife, State Parks, Caltrans, the Air Board, County Office of Agricultural Commissioner, County Health Services, and the City of Santa Cruz Water Department. Next slide lists the 11 organizations and businesses uh, that provided written comments. Bike Santa Cruz, Davenport, North Coast Association, Ecology Action, Friends of Rail Trail, Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks, Horan Lloyd, Attorneys at Law, Land Trust of Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County Greenway, Sierra Club, Trail Now. Next slide. So with all those written comment letters and the public hearing transcripts, we identified 192 individual comments within, and there's a response to each one of those comments in the final EIR. Many of the comments are similar or concern the same issues, and so for those, we developed master responses to address these in one fell swoop and to provide a more robust response. I'll touch briefly on those six uh, master responses for these common comments, 
and I'll provide the gist of the master response and just some bullet points about what the response was. The first bulleted list are, are those six topics, so those are going to occur on the next, each of the next slides. So the first one, um, these comments include broad statements and specific criticisms regarding the adequacy of the draft DIR. The comments do not demonstrate that the draft DIR failed to comply with express legal requirements or case law. The RTC Legal Council did not find the specific arguments which cited case law to be persuasive. The vast majority of the assertions that the draft DIR is not legally adequate are examples of disagreement with factual assumptions or conclusion in the document and suggestions of how additional tests or study might be helpful to the decision makers. The RTC expended great effort to fully comply with CEQA and believes the EIR is legally adequate under CEQA. Next master response. These comments suggest that the project may not be feasible due to concerns about ownership and right-of-way and that the draft EIR is deficient for not including an extensive analysis on feasibility. The RTC is confident that the project can be implemented with varying degrees of difficulty. CEQA does not require EIRs to include detailed analyses of feasibility. EIRs are prepared on the assumption that a project at a minimum is potentially feasible. Next master response. This is a, a very comprehensive one uh, that involves the parking evaluation, and I'm not going to get into that part of it. Uh, but we do have um, Frederick with Kimley Horn here if there are specific questions. I'm going to focus on the, the gates and the hours and cl trail closure and parking lot closure. Um, there were conflicting comments from agencies and organizations regarding trail and parking lot closure and hours. Some, like the California Coastal Commission, want parking lots to be open at night to maximize public access to coastal resources. Others, such as State Parks and Davenport North Coast Association, want them closed due to public safety problems associated with nighttime use. The proposed project does not include gates, just signage that the trail would be closed at night, which is a pretty general statement. Uh, the draft EIR was revised to provide a little bit more clarification and specificity. It clarified that the trail would be closed at night to support existing agriculture adjacent to the trail and protect the public from pesticide spraying and to discourage illegal camping. It was also revised to acknowledge state park hours are from sunset to 8 a.m. And it was revised to clarify that the exact hours of parking lot, restroom, and trail closure would be determined through coordination with state parks, coastal commission, Caltrans, and affected property owners. Next master response. Some comments state that alternatives one and three could be constructed much sooner than the proposed project due to ownership and right-of-way issues and because the process for alternatives one and three shouldn't take that long. The project description stated that the proposed project could be constructed by 2020 and alternatives one and three could be constructed by 2038. The draft EIR was revised to clarify that the proposed project construction would be by 2021, not 2020, and that's because additional time is required now due to RTC's decision to conduct this full EIR and CFL's responsibilities to do federal compliance with the National Environmental Protection Act afterwards. And uh, the CFL said that the project funds, their FLAP grant, could be extended by a year. RTC estimates alternatives one and three would not begin construction until 2028, I said 38 earlier, excuse me, it's 2028, because of the amount of work needed to undo contractual and regulatory obligations related to the rail right-of-way, and then the no termination is a, isn't effective until the Surface Transportation Board approves transfer or abandonment of freight service. Further, abandoning rail uses would require, require reimbursing the state 11 million or up to 29 million, which would take several years to amass. Additionally, the master response states that the threat of litigation is noted, but filing of litigation would not halt permitting nor preclude construction. The court would have to be persuaded that challenging an EIR on its merits was likely to succeed, and RTC believes this could not be demonstrated. I was getting a little out of my territory with all that legal stuff, so I'm glad we have the attorneys here for your questions. Um, the next common comment or master response. 
Some comments stated that RTC is biased in favor of the proposed project and that they inappropriately divided the project into small pieces by signing the rail operation agreement. The proposed project does not include rail service or changes to the rail line, nor does it preclude it. No piecemealing occurred because the proposed project and RTC's agreement with the operator each have independent utility or logical termini, meaning that they could legitimately proceed as separate distinct projects, neither depends on each other. Further, approving the operator agreement in 2018 was determined exempt from preparing a CEQA document because it is a continuation of an existing use and therefore does not constitute a new project. Another one? This is, my last, this is my last common comment and master response. Um, comments inquired about funding and responsibility for maintenance of the trail, parking areas, and mitigation. Funding would be provided by using Measure D funds and may include other sources. Trail, parking areas, and restrooms would be maintained by RTC, but likely through a contract with a private firm or other agencies that could include county parks and rec, county public works, or some combination thereof through formal agreements. Um, once maintenance responsibility is determined, a trail manager would be identified and an operations and maintenance plan would be developed. That's the conclusion for the final EIR part of it. Um, I have one thing to say about next steps before turning it over to Corey. Um, there's some additional requirements after the final EIR that include um, making findings. Uh, CEQA requires that the lead agency uh, make one of these three findings listed. Those are prescribed in the guidelines uh, for each significant impact and the alternatives. So the first one says that changes have been made or required or incorporated into the project to mitigate those significant effects. In other words, the mitigation measures reduce the impact to a less than significant level. The second finding are those changes that would be the responsibility of another public agency and can or should be adopted by that agency. And then third, there are specific economic, legal, social, technological, or other considerations make that make the mitigation or alternatives infeasible. So there's a separate document that lists the potentially significant impacts and alternatives and has a finding for each one of those things. Uh, for the significant and unavoidable impacts, uh, an additional step is required and that is a statement of overriding considerations. Finally, um, there's a sequel requires that a mitigation monitoring and reporting program be adopted before approving a project and this is to ensure that the required mitigation measures are implemented. It's what gives it legal teeth, if you will. And with that, Corey's gonna talk about the other next steps. Thank you, Kate and Megan. Um, so before I go into the next steps, I just want to identify the fact that we have an errata handout to you. Um, I won't identify um, everything that it contains. Um, it does basically um, amend uh, specificity that we provided to um, buffers um, that would be provided from pesticide applications to the trail, and it also uh, eliminates, eliminates a specificity of um, hours of um, spraying and um, and its coordination with uh, public use hours. So basically, it um, it, it removes some specificity, and uh, that is to align with state parks practices and also the Department of Pesticide Regulation um, uh, procedures. Corey, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I found a typo on the handout and I wanted to correct it for the record. Uh, near the bottom of the first page, you'll see a reference to uh, changes that would need to be made to volume one of the final EIR to conform with the wording changes shown above. And in the fourth bullet, you'll see a reference to page 517 and then a response to response 517. Uh, that should be response 56.7. So just want to make sure that uh, that's entered into the record. Thank you very much. So the next steps um, after today's, um, today's meeting, um, 
are outlined on this uh, slide here. We have a lot of work to complete to deliver the North Coast Rail Trail project. Um, we need to enter into agreements for right-of-way needs. Um, extensive work needs to be completed in order to um, uh, to make those arrangements. Um, CFL, the, the team delivering the project, will need to complete design and the environmental, the federal environmental clearance process. Um, the RTC will need to seek funding for construction of the two miles to Davenport and the three parking lots. Um, we need to enter into an agreement with central federal lands for implementation of some of the mitigation measures that are identified in the EIR, and that's because some of those are going to be the responsibility of the RTC, and some of those are going to be the responsibility of CFL during the construction uh, process and certainly as part of the design. And finally, we need to develop long-term maintenance and operations agreement agreements as um, Kate identified. Um, the RTC anticipates that we will be working with the county um, public works department or county uh, parks um, in order to provide um, for trail management program, and we would do that through agreement. Um, those those um, items need to be um, ironed out as we move forward. And construction, um, as has been indicated, um, was originally scheduled scheduled for 2020 in order for us to um, for uh, for us to have the time to develop the EIR CFL moved the construction schedule to tw the 2021 calendar year So today's action before you is to hold a public hearing after we answer your questions. Um, we recommend that you adopt a resolution certifying the final EIR as being compliant with the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, select the proposed project as the preferred alternative. Adopt the CEQA findings and statement of overriding considerations and adopt the mitig mitigation monitoring and reporting uh, program. And and um, all of those uh, documents are um, to be adopted or certified uh, with the errata uh, that has been handed out to you containing the minor changes. And that concludes our presentation. Corey, Megan, and Kate, thank you for that great uh, presentation and the coordination was fabulous. Okay, Commission, um, I'll take any questions now that you might have uh, on, on the uh, item. Any questions? There's, uh, there was one statement that was made uh, that no segment depends on another. I, I mean, don't they? They have to, don't they? Depend. On, I, I wasn't in the context of. That was in your, your good presentation. I just. Uh, it, it just seems like one segment does depend on the other. Um, I think that what you are referring to is um, Kate's mention of um, the uh, the interaction between development of trail projects and the rail operations. So those those not being interdependent, those each being standalone. I, I can be happy to take a stab at this. Uh, Jim Moose, you're outside CEQA Council. It's a common contention uh, for people who oppose projects that uh, the lead agency is guilty of something called piecemealing, which is uh, the sin under CEQA of defining your project too narrowly. Uh, the notion is that you're, you really have a bigger project in mind and you're looking just at a piece of it in order to sneak separate pieces uh, through the CEQA processes separately and avoid looking at the big picture. And both the federal courts and the California courts in dealing with contentions like that in, in the case law have developed legal tests as to when piecemealing actually occurs. And one of the tests is whether the particular project that someone contends is too small and is in fact part of a larger project actually has what's called independent utility, meaning that it, it can function by itself and is not solely dependent on larger undertakings in order for it to make sense to proceed uh, with the project. The very early cases in federal law talked about highway projects and things called logical termini. Uh, so the, the contention would be if you're building a road uh, from point A to point B and then there's point C over here, but you're not defining your project initially as going all the way to point C, 
is, is point B a logical terminus? Would anyone in their right mind build a road just from point A to point B, or would you only do that if you were then gonna go on to point C? Uh, so uh, with respect to the larger trail system, uh, we felt that this particular segment uh, would be a nice trail to have uh, on its own, even if it weren't connected to other trails, uh, because it would make a nice hike. It'd be great to have it as part of this larger system, but it could proceed on its own. And then with respect to the, uh, the action of uh, approving a contract with a, with a rail operator earlier this year, or I guess late last year, which drew litigation, uh, that didn't seem to be uh, inextricably intertwined with this project because the, the trail system, or I'm rather the, uh, the rail system exists, it historically has been operated as a freight system, and to continue doing that uh, was an action independent of this project. So it's all legalese, but uh, that's what it boils down to. We felt that this was a legitimate standalone project, and it's not so inextricably intertwined with other projects that as a matter of law, it couldn't have its own EIR. Thanks, thanks for clarifying that. Yes, sir. Um, I think maybe Luis Mendez can answer okay. that question. Um, there are multiple steps and multiple contracts and agreements in place, both with the rail operator, funding sources, California Transportation Commission, Surface Transportation Board. Um, Luis, why don't you elaborate? Uh, certainly. Um, yes, one, one of the uh, reasons that it will take time is to undo uh, basic commitments this commission has already made uh, associated with the with this rail line right away, and uh, one of the uh, you know primary commitments is this this commission ex uh, 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 using state funding to acquire this uh, this rail line right away that came from the California Transportation Commission. That state funding is um, specifically for rail. Uh, passenger rail uh, uh, projects and operations, and the RTC could, you know, uh, take the action to um, pay back the money to the state and um, uh, and get rid of the the rail line, um, which would be required for that alternative. Um, it will take some time for the RTC to have that that funding available uh, at the moment. Like for example, for Measure D, the RTC gets at 1.6 million dollars uh, in in funding per year that can be used for the rail pot and, and Measure D. Um, what would be required to pay to the, C to the CTC would be at least $11 million, but based on the agreement with the state, it could be potentially up to you know, over $25 million, depending what the, what the state determines the value of the property be at, the, at that point in time uh, through you know, whatever method they, they use uh, and so on. Um, so that's that's one piece, and there, there's of course the, the obligation that uh, the RTC bought this line uh, with a freight easement on it, uh, and that freight easement is owned by a rail operator, and and the uh, uh, determinations of whether that freight easement will continue to exist or not has to be made by the Surface Transportation Board, a federal agency. So that would be a, a process that the RTC would have to go to to undo that, and it is uncertain what the results of that process would be. Um, so that. Those are a couple of the main points. There are others, of course. But. And then my second question has to do with the, uh, um, the funding that you grant referred to that came from the state that might need to be repaid back. Uh, is abandoning any portion of the, of the line, or I it's just this project is part of the, the entire line, but is just this section were abandoned, you believe the entire grant would need to be give, given back as opposed to none of it is part of it? <coughs> Well, any, any portion that the RTC then abandons, so it's, it, it would be possible to have you know, an abandonment of a certain portion of the line, uh, but still, you still have to work with the California Transportation Commission and figure out how, you, how you're going to um, uh, pay that money back and have the fu funding available to do that, and you still have to work with the Service Transportation Board to, uh, 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 to get approval for that abandon abandonment. Like, it's, like I said, the, the, the um, Results of that process are uncertain because it depends on what sort of challenges there may be and so on, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, 
is it absolutely clear that that money would have been given back? As opposed to maybe some you apply this some other way that would help the state. The state, the state, the California Transportation Commission has been unequivocal in its in its statements about having to pay that money back. Both in writing and, and in, in, in writing, exactly. <laughs> and then the last question is just um, the <coughs> the EIR first. <coughs> I can answer that. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, certification of an EIR is a precondition to taking action on a project, but it doesn't preordain any particular outcome. You could certify an EIR and just decide you don't want to approve any project. You could approve the proposed project. If you're inclined today to approve an alternative, uh, that would be within your discretion. The paperwork in front of you uh, doesn't support that because the paperwork in front of you reflects the staff recommendation, but you could direct us to go back and make the paperwork conform to whatever decision you made. But the final EIR doesn't <coughs> steer you in a particular direction. Okay, so it doesn't set us up for doing something that could come back and... Okay, I just wanted to... Yeah, it it's just a, a step you have to take before you can take action on the project. Okay, okay. Like the process. Sure. Thank you. Commissioner Coonerty. Uh, yeah, so thank you, and I look forward to hearing public comments. I think it's worth, uh, the EIR always goes right into the weeds, and it's always worth stepping back and remembering the larger uh, purpose, which is we were able to get this federal grant that's very specific in its purpose, which is to connect po uh, urban populations to national uh, open air, uh, national uh, protected areas. Uh, we have the Coast Ch Chitoni Coast Areas National Monument coming online. This is a connection that brings us from Wilder Ranch uh, to that, and then we're working with the Land Trust, uh, who's been a great partner in this. We, we can plan and uh, design the trail going all the way up to Davenport. It gets uh, bicyclists off the Highway 1, where we've had several fatalities. Uh, it uh, leverages these outside funds, it creates some infrastructure on the North Coast, which is much needed to deal with the influx of population that have, that have discovered the North Coast in recent years. Uh, and it also, uh, and also to keep in mind, we do have uh, a trail that runs from Santa Cruz to Wilder Ranch through agricultural, uh, working agricultural fields, for more than a decade. That use has, uh, I think, has worked on both sides and we've given our staff now the opportunity to spend more time working with the agricultural uh, uses which we really value on the North Coast to figure out how to best uh, adjust this project even further than we already have uh, to, to, to meet their needs. And it's a tremendous opportunity uh, to create safe, passage up at, up the north coast uh, using uh, funds that we that we need to spend uh, uh, sooner rather than later uh, in order to in order to create a, a project that works for this community <coughs> any other questions I've just got a note here uh, to remind all the commissioners that uh, the people in the back are having trouble hearing and these microphones work better when your mouth is close to them so try to do that okay so at this point we'll go ahead and open the public hearing and uh, allow uh, people to come up and comment we're going to allow two minutes for public comment so you can go ahead and line up if you'd like come up and uh, address the commission no, I don't want the hat. I've known too many of these people too long uh, my name is Robert Redoni, representing the North Coast Farmers up there. Got probably a 90-year history, not a probably we do. I have a 90-year history of farming up there. We have in the past had some issues with the RTC in trying to cut off a couple of our crossings that are critical to our operations. Um, for those of you who don't know, in the past, there was a lot of small farms up there 90 years ago. Now it's, we've kind of combined them over the years. so. If you look on a map, these crossings may not look critical, but they are critical to our operations. And there's a lot of other issues in regards to, you know, hours of operations that coexist with our existing farming operations that I think need to be considered. The RTC has reached out to us. We encourage them to continue reaching out to us to come up with a win-win solution for all of us. But if we continue to butt heads, 
we're not going to have a win-win solution for all of us. Thank you for those comments. Appreciate them. Thanks. Uh, Brian Peoples, Trail Now. Thank you. Um, real quick, um, our plan, the farmer's plan, diverts it about 30% up along the, the roadway, and um, it, it en enables that greater access by the public. You're working with the farmers, the people who are gonna be living with this. Now, to be specific on the, some of the technical things, uh, we disagree that it will be 2028. Um, you, if you look at the records, um, the CTC in September 2015 authorized uh, giving the money back, so there's no timeline on that. The other third milestone that you need on the Surface Transportation Board, the 2020, 2009 study showed that it would not um, re be objected by the Surface Transportation Board from the Woodside Commission. Um, the other thing you want to take into account is the historical reference. This is very important uh, because what you'll find is Hidden Beach Trestle, Capitola Trestle, Sur seascape trestle. So if you set a precedent up there to dictate how you're going to have your trail today for the north coast, the southern section, you're, to have a train, you gotta tear those trestles down. They're historical, so remember that part of that um, aspect. Um, the other thing we wanna point out is, um, you know, the farmers are giving up land. The farmers came here, I tried to get Robert to wear the pink hat, and the pink hat represents collaboration, right? He wouldn't do it, but that's what we're about. We want a win-win solution. We want you guys to work with them, so we're hoping that the EIR gets approved with the stipulation that you direct staff to work with the farmers, the property owners, on a win-win solution and have that trail go more in the scenic area. And actually, we, we disagree the timeline. We believe it can start before 2020 with our plan because you can begin the farmland section. So Thank that's you. an important aspect. Thank you, Mr. People. Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is David Van Brink. I live in Santa Cruz City. On the subject of coastal access and regarding the Sierra Club's letter of March 5th, uh, the Sierra Club letter makes a number of claims regarding the closure of the informal crossing at Laguna Beach uh, that have no evidence to support, support them. That it's the most used access point for the surf break. It is a surf break of regional significance that the access is heavily used by the surf community and that sunrise to 9 a.m. is when the access is typically used. Uh, it surprises me that uh, the local group of the Sierra Club, whose motto is to explore, enjoy, and protect the planet, would object to closing an informal trail that is obviously damaging the natural ecosystem of the California coast. Sierra Club also claims that closing of this informal access point will have a significant effect on public access to a regional surfing destination in conflict with the Coastal Act. But the California Coastal Commission, in their latest letter from uh, March 6th, uh, did not make an issue of, of this closing of the informal access. So there's no basis that we can see of the Sierra Club's claim there. Lastly, the Sierra Club mentions they see no enhancement of safety as claimed in the response, as people will continue to cross the street at this point. Again, this is a claim without uh, any substantial evidence or expert's opinion. Uh, so none of their claims are, are well supported in their letter. Please ignore these last minute claims and move forward with the North Coast Trail Project uh, today. The final EIR is solid, reliable document, and you can surely now make a decision in support of moving forward with the staff's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, uh, my name is Gillian Greensight, and I'm here representing the Sierra Club Santa Cruz County Group. And uh, we want to thank uh, the final EIR makers of that who responded to uh, many of our concerns. Uh, we did appreciate that. Uh, we noticed that there were still areas of concern, and I'll very briefly, since I believe you have a handout, did everybody get the handout? Yes, okay, I don't, okay, good, thank you. Won't waste more time on that. Uh, I have some if you didn't. Um, three areas remain of concern and we hope that you will incorporate these into uh, your vote today. One is the California red-legged frog that uh, to be considered less than significant mitigation must replace uh, lost habitat at a three to one ratio. We um, appreciated the inclusion of a qualified biologist but we'd like to see that specific 
ethnic ratio, uh, that lost habitat replacement in the final final. With tree removal, we um, still note an absence of um, uh, having an accurate and complete accounting of trees to be removed. Uh, would appreciate more detail on that. This is a very important impact. Uh, the pesticide use, we noted again that it is still in the monitoring period. Uh, we're not talking about agricultural work here, it's trail maintenance, and we would like to urge you to take a closer look at that to extend that beyond just the monitoring period, and, and ideally um, no pesticides or herbicides besides used uh, in this segment. And just lastly, on the coastal access, we still maintain that closing the informal crossing will have impacts, and we hope that we will look at that carefully. And thank you very much. We hope you will consider these um, Im uh, impacts in your final vote. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Sheila Brannon. I am a Senior Park and Rec Specialist with California State Parks, Santa Cruz District. The Santa Cruz District has been working collaboratively with the RTC on the rail trail project for the past several years. We appreciate the RTC staff reach out to us at its initial stages and continue to engage with us. State Parks supports the trail and have participated in the design process. Recreation is an important part of our mission. And we believe that this new trail will offer an additional source of recreation to the public throughout Wilder Ranch and throughout the Coast Dairies properties. We have successfully managed recreation adjacent to our agricultural leases for many years and look forward to many more years of farming on the North Coast. State Parks supports the RTC staff report and we look forward to continuing our collaboration with the RTC as the next phase proceeds into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Val Cole. I'm a 29-year resident of the county. Um, this is a phenomenal project, <laughs> uh, in my opinion. Um, myself and another citizen, Greg Larson, put a petition up uh, in support of the final EIR on change.org on Sunday morning. I think you've probably seen it in your packet. By the time we submitted that, there were 343 people supporting it. And my only point coming up here is to say, as of nine o'clock this morning, that number had increased to 456. Uh, everything Ryan said is true. This is a really dangerous part of the coast, whether you're walking it or riding it. And building this trail is gonna open up just phenomenal opportunities for us to actively recreate on our own and with our family safely. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos. Um, I'm really excited about this this project. It's 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 like a twofer. You have a trail, and you have a rail line, and both of these could be activated. They they could both be done in I think ten years if we commit ourselves to it. Um, I strongly support the proposed plan. Uh, it was the original plan until we discovered that we we had uh, that that the county had. Uh, errors in the location of the easement with respect to the tra uh, tracks, and so we've gone through this process, and I think it's a, a great process to have gone through. Uh, but here we stand at a point where we can go ahead with the original plan, keeping the trail on the coastal side. What a wonderful thing, without uh, sacrificing a, a, an active rail line that we will probably need uh, when, when the Davenport uh, work is done. I think eventually something will happen up there. Um, you know, I've said it before, the rail line is like a birthright. It's, it's our endowment to the future. I, I can't imagine tearing it out for, for any reason, especially at a time when, when transit is becoming more important, when people, uh, the, the use of private automobiles is, is declining. Um, and, and the original intention of purchasing that rail line was for, for passenger rail service. So uh, I hope you'll all vote for the uh, proposed plan and move ahead with trail construction soon. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Hi, my name is Tina Andrietta and I live in Aptos. I've lived here since 1985 and I'm a home and homeowners and my house is across the street from the rail. I completely support keeping the rail line. Uh, 
and I'm asking you to please approve the proposed project as the preferred alternative and expedite building the trail along the coastal side. Please keep, keep the rail for future use as it serves the needs of our entire community. The 32 mile rail trail is a historic landmark, let's keep it. Get the trail completed as soon as possible and then repair the rail line for light rail use as soon as possible. Highway 1 is dangerous. I used to ride my bike on Highway 1 and tell my husband when he found out I was riding it, <laughs> he actually said, please don't ride the, um, on Highway 1 any longer, you know, up to Davenport uh, when I lived on the west side. So please keep the proposed project and the preferred alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sally Arnold. Um, I'm the new chair of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. And um, as you've seen in your packet, the public comments are overwhelmingly in favor of the North Coast Trail as proposed along the coastal side of the existing tracks. It's gonna be a beautiful recreational asset for our community, um, as Mr. Coonerty mentioned. and. Um, Unlike Tina, I would never ride my bike on Highway 1. It terrifies me just to be driving up there and see cyclists on that road. Um, but I do ride that little spur that goes to Wilder. And you know I feel perfectly safe doing that. And if it was continued on to Davenport, I would do that. I mean, that would be a wonderful recreational opportunity. And um, I think it would bring tourist dollars to our community to expand that and make it a real, you know, a worthwhile destination for cyclists who are perhaps a little more timid than Tina. Um, we urge you to certify the final EIR and approve the proposed project with the preferred alignment. It is the best choice for the environment as was already presented. It's certainly the best choice from, for cyclists, far from the highway. Um, it's the best choice financially because it does protect that more than $10 million that's already been earmarked for the project, as well as avoids that 11 to $25 million payback to the state, which would be horrible. Um, and it is the best choice for efficiency because it can be completed so many years sooner than the alternative alignments. You know, it can be started in 2021 instead of 28. Um, so we thank you for all your patient work on this project. I know it's been a long time coming and we just encourage you to support the staff recommendations and approve this trail now without further delays. I'd like to be fit enough to ride this trail when it finally gets built. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erica Snoyevich and I'm the conservation chair of the Sierra Club. And I would say my personal biggest concern, and it's certainly a huge concern for the, the club, is the red-legged frog. The California red-legged frog is a species of concern, and it does reside directly along the tracks, not, not in the streams next to the track, but directly along the tracks. Um, and so the proposed one-to-one -one mitigation of habitat restoration for the frog doesn't seem adequate at all, and we want to see a three-to-one mitigation for the wetland loss in order to support the frog. Um, and again, we're also very concerned about the trees, tree loss that are not being specified. There's simply not enough information about that. Um, and there's a one-to-one -one proposed replacement for the trees. Um, however, mature trees are simply not the same as potted plants that you plant along. Um, there's certainly um, a loss of de a death of trance that you replace, of trees that are replaced, and so those need to be, um, it much needs to be a much higher mitigation, we uh, ask for a three to one mitigation for the trees, as well as, um, and of course to account for the fact that mature trees are very, very different from, uh, anyway, so thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Strauss. Good morning, Yannicka Strauss with Bike Santa Cruz County. The most significant uh, characteristic of the proposed project is really that it will, it could begin construction in 2021. Um, the immense benefits which have been uh, shared by many people so far, safety, um, access, a carbon-free access to recreational areas. Um, these can all be experienced sooner by our community with moving forward with the proposed project. Um, additionally, the proposed project has a superior trail design, um, 12 feet wide with a six foot paved, um, unpaved uh, shoulder and then two foot shoulder on the other side. Um, this is a huge benefit to both cyclists, pedestrians, anyone using the trail. 
So uh, we support the staff recommendation and we urge you to certify the EIR and to continue to keep this project moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Marty DeMere, North Coast resident. I understand the limits of an EIR, project EIR, but it's not beyond the foresight of this commission to look at the bigger picture or the larger purpose, as Mr. Coonerty put it. So I urge you not to certify this EIR and instead revisit the parking, traffic, and access assumptions. It's not sufficient to simply post signs in Santa Cruz promoting walking and biking or to suggest that parking on the shoulders of the highway is a mitigation because I'm sure you've all heard about the problems in Big Sur, Point Lobos, and Muir Woods where shoulder parking has become untenable and dangerous for visitors. There really is a larger picture going on here with the confluence of this trail, the Cotoni Coast Dairies Project, and improved visitation to state parks facilitated by the Coastal Commission's new iPhone app so I hope you'll step back and look at the bigger picture on the North Coast and realize that a decision today could set a precedent for a very dangerous and troublesome situation along Highway 1. Thank you. Thank you. Howdy, my name is Ian, I'm a Fulton resident. I wanna appreciate all the good work you guys are doing with uh, b coming up with the future plans for the rails and trails. I work for Roaring Camp Railroads. I actually support the community a lot with uh, volunteer projects around here. I also uh, s supported myself with a uh, trail that goes from Poganip to Rincon for uh, bicycles to help people um, get a trail that goes along the railroad tracks from Felton all the way to Santa Cruz. And also Roaring Camp um, served the community with like, we uh, help the park rangers and we help the city with uh, um, the trash train. We'll use our locomotives to help bring all the homeless trash that's accumulated along the railroad tracks over the years. And we'll also, the railroad benefits a lot with the, um, the community to be able to move equipment in and out. And to, if you guys are building a trail from Santa Cruz to Davenport, you can use the train to bring materials and equipment to the isolated locations that are harder to get by road. Also, um, we use the train for emergencies for like in case somebody gets hurt somewhere along the railroad tracks. The fire department will call us and we'll bring the train out there, rescue the person, whether they're on a bike or a canoe or um, somebody got hurt at a Garden of Eden. The railroad actually benefits helping get the injured persons out and then get them transported to the hospital. Also, the railroad is a huge uh, benefit for if there's an emergency like the 1982 flood. The Southern Pacific Railroad actually brought a bunch of tank cars of water up to Felton and supplied the town with uh, showers and uh, washing materials and stuff like that. So the railroad benefits with the community. And I wanna appreciate you guys for doing a good job and uh, support you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Slade, Executive Director of the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. A lot of new faces on the commission. <laughs> and most of you weren't here six years ago when the Land Trust got involved, uh, when we were asked to provide matching funds for a grant to build this segment. And we agreed to do that and didn't get the grant, so your staff came back and asked for more money the next year. <laughs> we did get the grant. We have $4 million we are ready to spend building this section. We urge you to adopt the staff recommendations, approve the EIR, choose the preferred scenario, and let's get this built. You've heard about the advantages. It's time to get it done. We wanna spend the money, okay? We're not earning anything in the banks these days. So let's get it done and then look at the next project and the one after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Chair, Commissioners, my name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional civil engineer with a three decade long uh, career here in Santa Cruz County. And I just wanted to mention a couple of things you've heard from everybody. Everybody supports this project. There's a few that, that are you know detractors. Um, but I wanted to mention the farmers. I think the North Coast farmers are an important asset to our community. Um, and they've raised some important issues that, that need further uh, further work. But I don't think they've raised anything here 
that would prevent you from certifying this EIR. It's an extraordinarily thorough document. I've seen a few in my day, and uh, this one's uh, probably one of the best. And, uh, and then I think in addition to certifying the EIR, you should go ahead and approve the North Coast Trail. The, the preferred alignment really is superior for many reasons. Um, not the least of which is public safety. You know, the, the record shows that there are bicyclists getting hit, they're getting injured, and they're dying. And, you know, the faster we build this trail, the sooner we can stop that uh, personal injury and death. Uh, so I would encourage you to go ahead and select the preferred alignment. Let's move ahead with the trail. Let's make this place safer and better. And um, before I forget, I'll just check my notes. Gosh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan Sarnataro from Live Oak. I'm a Greenway supporter, but I don't speak for Greenway because actually in this case, I'm gonna say something that they don't agree with. But uh, the issue of taking the tracks out and putting a trail in, I think in the case of this North Coast corridor, that's nowhere near as important as it is in other segments of the trail. So I'm supporting uh, the staff recommendation here because the trail that we will get will at least protect bicyclists from traffic. It'll be 12 feet wide. There's enough room in this segment for this to happen. What I, and so in, in my case, I'd say, you know, the, I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. In terms of the rest of the corridor, I don't think that you should take this as a template for the most expeditious or beneficial way to go forward. There are other considerations, and so please don't generalize the decision that gets made here to decisions that need to be made in the future about other segments of the, of the trail. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else like to speak at the uh, public hearing? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for action and discussion. So, Mr. Uh, Coonerty. Yeah, thank you. I wanna, it's an exciting day. It's taken a, a little longer to get here than uh, I think some of us anticipated. Uh, but I'd like to move the staff recommendation and also thank the, the entire team uh, from the federal folks who did the design work to uh, our consultants, to our RTC staff, uh, to the to the county folks who have partnered on this um, on doing a really good study uh, that really identified the resources and possibilities and will continue to do as we uh, move forward on this, pro continue to do excellent work as we move forward on this project. Second. A motion by Coonerty, second by Leopold. Uh, Commissioner Leopold. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for everyone's uh, comments today. You know, uh, this uh, vision of a trail uh, <laughs> has been a long sought off uh, sought after uh, amenity uh, for our community. Uh, th this segment actually represents a great uh, vision of collaboration and partnership uh, because we are working with uh, federal agencies, uh, local government, uh, local citizens, and local organizations to fund, build, and, and be able to use this uh, portion of the trail. Uh, it's really exciting to see that we're gonna, we're gonna with the action today that we can uh, start looking towards a date of construction. Um, the sooner the better, I think, is what the, the community would like. Uh, but I really appreciate the fact that uh, people have come together uh, to help make this happen, and I'm glad um, in doing this uh, significant environmental review that we are able to identify the issues uh, so we can move forward and create the best trail possible. Commissioner Brown. I'm um, happy to support the motion. I do have a question related to the mitigations on the red-legged frog and, and tree uh, replacement. Um, I'm just wondering at what point might we hear back about whether or not those, I mean obviously this is ways down the road, um, to, to establish whether or not those mitigations are um, adequate. I mean, we're sort of, we're talking about, you know, legally we have to do the one-to-one -one, um, replacement mitigation um, under the, but, but I'm just wondering if, if there's some, what the, pl I mean I know we have a monitoring plan as well, but I'm just wanting to get a sense of like when we might hear back as a commission about that. And then I have, I mean I just have to ask, 
closure of the Laguna crossing, I'm not sure how that could actually happen. So I know we're recommending it, but it doesn't seem possible to me. So f I'd just be interested to hear since it was raised. Um, I'll address the Laguna crossing and then have Ecosystems West, um, our biologists, um, address the, your first question. So in terms of the closure of the Laguna crossing, it is a really dangerous um, crossing and it's really hard to accommodate a formalized um, crossing there. Um, it's not approved by the CPUC. Um, in um, designing this project, the federal team is going to have to work with the CPUC to close some of the crossings that are used on an informal basis right now and um, formalize other ones that are being used. Um, they, there's a no net gain in, um, in the CPUC's uh, requirements and sometimes they actually require that um, you close down um, two crossings when you open one. So we're, we're gonna need to work very closely with the CPUC and essentially um, the crossing at Laguna is not a CPUC recognized crossing. It's very unlikely that it could be formalized because of the dangerous location, we would be placing fencing. What people do, um, we're not going to be able to actually control, um, but fencing will be in pl put in place to ensure public safety. And th that is really the, the overriding consideration is public safety. We understand the views are important, but um, it's a dangerous location. And I will ask uh, Ecosystems West to come up and address your other question. Thank you for that. Hi, Erin McGinty <coughs> with Ecosystems West. Uh, with regard to the California red-legged frog, the intent of the no net loss mitigation ratio is to really give the stakeholders and the agencies that will be involved during the permitting process maximum flexibility. So further down the line, this project is gonna go through a permitting process and you'll have California Department of Fish and Wildlife, US Fish and Wildlife, the Coastal Commission, state parks, and the stakeholders all involved in designing the biological resources management plan. The no net loss will allow those participants to make proper determinations based on the resources. So, for example, you might not want to mitigate uh, fallow agricultural land with backer shrubs encroaching at a ratio of three to one, whereas you would certainly want to mitigate wetlands at a ratio of three to one, depending on what the agencies determine. So, uh, really, the w we anticipate that for the more sensitive resources, that the, the mitigation ratios may be higher than one to one. Remington finishes. Hi, Justin Davila, Ecosystems West. I just want to touch on the trees a little bit. Um, to give a little background, uh, during the actual process of preparing it, we did extensive on the ground field surveys. The entire seven and a half miles were walked over the period of two weeks. There was a rare plant survey and there was detailed habitat mapping that I did. Personally, hand drawing and using GPS units to come up with these different habitat types that you see in there. As far as trees go, there wasn't really the time or <coughs> the need to do a complete inventory or ar arboreal tree inventory along the line. The vast majority of trees that occur along this line are they're basically arboreal shrubs. A lot of them are willows or smaller oaks or the larger trees are actually off the line. They may be in the study area. They're not going to be impacted by the project directly. In the process of finalizing the, the designs for the plans and coming up with the mitigations for the different habitat types, whether they be Esha or individual trees or other species, that will be taken into consideration and the determination of the mitigation requirements, the ratio offsets, will follow a similar process of dealing with the different agencies and the stakeholders and coming up with the best feasible plan for mitigating these resources and obviously taking close consideration into the value of the trees that are going to be removed. And then furthermore, if you were to look at the county uh, significant tree ordinance for areas outside the rural and urban services line, those trees are actually not protected until they're up to 48 inches 
in diameter, which are large trees. There are no trees like that. And we're not saying that we wouldn't want to mitigate for smaller trees, but the tree species that are along this line, they're very important, but a lot of them are taken into consideration under other mitigation scenarios for the Esha, like the willow scrub and, um, you know, what's that? Coast live oak forest, these are talked about in, in other contexts. And again, those will all come into play into the, into the resource management plan, which must be approved and certified before the project begins anyway. So that's pretty much what I have to say about that. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Bertrand. So I just have a question about the um, biological. So the thing that I'm wondering about, so mitigations, mitigation measures are gonna be taken, but like let's say for the red-legged frog, I mean, it probably took years, I don't know how long, for them to adapt to a certain area. So in terms of mitigation for trees, frogs, whatever, how long is this process gonna be monitored so that the successful uh, outcome can be determined? So we don't have the exact number of years of monitoring that would be required, but uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is, will certainly be involved, and you know it's their primary interest to protect federally listed species. So I think we can trust them to approve a plan that's going to be protective for that species. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd just like to make a general comment. Um, uh, not, not to you. Sorry. Okay. Thank you for those comments. Yeah. So, um, Supervisor Kearney uh, mentioned safety, and this is going to be a great improvement. Um, I was a member of InShape in Capitol on 41st Avenue, and the accident along Highway 1 changed the nature of so many people's uh, lives. Um, that one particular accident won't we'll talk about, but everyone involved in InShape knew about that, and. I've heard of so many other stories in the 30 plus years I've been in Santa Cruz of the statements of, of the impacts on various people's lives. Um, we have a dog park in Capitola uh, dedicated to one of those persons. So anything that improves safety on Highway 1 for bicyclists, I think this is going to be a great boom for this area. Thank you. Comment? Yes, sir. I look forward to riding the, the North Coast and the trail on the beautiful coast with my family. So. Thanks also to everybody who participated and brought it to this point. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Comment? Comments? Okay. I, I think this is. Uh I think we're heading in the right direction. I, uh, I, I believe that uh, staff is working with the, uh, the groups that are down there that have questions and concerns, and I'm pretty confident that we're gonna be able to mitigate all the concerns and keep all the interested parties happier. So I, I think we're moving forward. So no other comments, I'm gonna go ahead and call for vote. Uh, can, yes. Um, sorry, um, Chair Bortroff, can you clarify that the, the um, motion is to support the staff recommendation that includes the RADA? I believe the motion, make another yes, motion. It, yes, it does. Uh, it was a staff recommendation including the errata. And the second is okay with that. Okay, so we are intact. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we're going to move on with the schedule. We're going to go back a little bit because we've got some cleanup to do. Um, what I'd like to do first is uh, I, I want to go back to the uh, item on the consent agenda that we carried over, and I'll let uh, yeah, I'll go ahead, Luis. Sir, I, I think you, you also skipped uh, oral communication. I got a bunch of stuff I okay, skipped, right, yeah. I'm, right. uh, I'm, I'm going to go, we're let, just to let you know, we're going to go to uh, back to item eight, then we're going to go to oral communications, and then proceed from there. So if we can get, uh, make your comments, are you, are you gonna make the presentation, Mr. Preston? Since it was pulled from the agenda and our staff person is here, I think it's appropriate to have Rachel present. Even better, Th thank you. Ms. Marconi, go ahead. Good morning, commissioners. Rachel Marconi of your staff. Before you today is consideration of some state funds that the Regional Transportation Commission is responsible for selecting projects to receive. Um, these are the Low Carbon Transit Operations Program Funds, or LCTOP. Um, these funds are generated through the sale of carbon fees um, through the state's cap and trade program. This year, uh, the funds are distributed to transit agencies as well as regional agencies. And this year, the Regional Transportation Commission's share of funds is about $511,000. 
the Regional Transportation Commission can select projects to receive these funds from the list of types of projects that start on page one of the staff report. They include a range of um, free bus passes, um, new vehicles that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, facilities at bus stops that might encourage more people to shift their mode from driving alone perhaps to riding a bus, um, as well as infrastructure associated with um, uh, electric vehicles. There are some rules associated with these funds because they are part of the state's cap and trade program. The California Air Resources Board and California Environmental Protection Agency has developed some um, charts showing what areas of Santa Cruz County and other areas of the state are considered disadvantaged communities. Um, the goal of the program is to make sure that at least a significant portion of these funds are um, serving uh, folks that live in in those areas that have been so classified by the state. This year, um, we have, we took a proposal to our elderly and disabled transportation um, advisory committee soliciting their ideas for this grant program. They looked at their unmet needs hearing um, project list and identified uh, free fixed route transit rides for ADA paratransit eligible passengers with the goal of shifting folks from paratransit onto the fixed route bus system um, as one idea and priority and the other was uh, projects that promote electrification of the transit and paratransit system. So we uh, received some request letters from both Liftline and Metro requesting some of these funds. Um, last night we re received a revised request from Santa Cruz Metro staff and that is reflected in underlying strikeout in the staff report. Staff concurs with the Metro's request as does Liftline to allow Liftline to receive 100% of what was requested by Liftline this year because they have a project that can be implemented quickly, um, well, Metro would anticipate that future, in the future, next year, um, Liftline would waive any um, claim to the fiscal year 1920 funds and that those funds be made available to Metro. Staff and Liftline and Metro all concur with this proposal to allocate $218,710 to Santa Cruz Metro for its electric charging infrastructure and battery storage project for zero emission buses and allocate $292,605 to Community Bridges lift line to use towards their par electric paratransit vehicles and charging equipment. Um, there were a few other recommendations included in that letter we received last night. We would like to have a little bit more time to discuss those other ideas with Metro, Caltrans, and stakeholders um, and would return to you in the future to address what would be possibly done with future year funds. But with that, um, we recommend approval of the revised staff recommendation and resolution. Thank you for clarifying that uh, discussion. Any questions? I'm gonna go and open it to the public. Anybody from the public like to speak? Mr. Cancino, step on up. Ray Cancino, CEO of Community Bridges. Um, we just like to thank the partnership of uh, Santa Cruz Metro um, for kind of uh, helping us get our project ahead of time um, and uh, letting us uh, do greenhouse uh, uh, reductions uh, sooner than later. And so this is really gonna allow us, uh, earlier last year we received a quarter of a million dollars to um, help us get two buses um, and they're gonna be in operation, but uh, limited range is about 110 miles and when we're gonna put them to road, we're probably gonna get 80 miles. And so uh, part of this project is allowing us the infrastructure that's gonna be a shared infrastructure. Uh, we're gonna start working with Metro, VTA, and uh, MS, uh, to try to look at where infrastructure needs to be developed in the county. So these uh, current level um, electric vehicles are actually gonna be able to be used throughout the uh, county and uh, we don't have to wait for any type of long-term overnight charging. So we're just really uh, fortunate to have that development in partnership with Metro and we really appreciate um, their management team allowing us to get our project done um, and kind of shifting dollars around to help us get there. So thank you also to staff uh, for answering emails so late last night uh, while this was being coordinated. So thank you so much for everyone's work. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. 
Hello, my name is uh, Kirk Hans. I'm the program director for LiftLine, a program of community bridges. And LiftLine is the Consolidated Transportation Service Agency for Santa Cruz County. I'd like to thank the RTC for their support through all the years. And also uh, with the um, LC Top, I'd like to thank uh, Metro for their um, working with us on that and we're looking forward and ho uh, hoping that you approve this uh, funding. We're looking forward to a one nine passenger electric vehicle that is wheelchair accessible and two th level three charging stations which will allow us to charge our vehicles in 20 minutes to 85% of the capacity. And one, the, one of the charging stations would be installed in the disadvantaged uh, area of Watsonville, as well as the nine passenger electric paratransit vehicle will operate out of there. But also that vehicle would uh, provide transportation throughout the county. And then one charging uh, station is slated to go into the Mount Community Resource Center in Felton, right off of Highway 9 with easy, easy access. And as Ray had mentioned, we would uh, share these with other uh, transit services throughout the uh, county and uh, we look forward to this project and look forward to being part of reducing greenhouse gases and uh, providing mobility as soon as possible. Thank you. Sounds exciting, great. Uh, any other uh, comments from the public? I'll go ahead and bring it back. For Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, recommend the uh, recommended actions and just say congratulations to LiftLine and Metro for working together, being a, uh, a board member of Metro. This is a great example of working together for our, a cleaner alternative for our public transportation system, particularly obviously to LiftLine. So thank you very much uh, for working together and uh, just like to recommend this motion. Okay, we've got a motion by McPherson. Second. 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 Yes. And, and comment on that. And, and, and it is great to see the co collaboration throughout our county. Uh, and I think we need to continue doing this to, to lower down our greenhouse emissions and also serve our, our most needy, our elderly and our disabled and, uh, and, our, and our disadvantaged communities. So I think it's, this is a great opportunity to show to the rest of the community how we all work together. Any comments? Comments? Okay, before I give a vote, I, I want to echo what Mr. Cancino said, and McPherson also, and Gonzalez. You know, this this is great. Uh, the, it's, I feel like there's a new energy in the Regional Transportation Commission here to seek out great relationships with our partners, which is Metro and uh, LiftLine here, and to be able to figure out who needs the money. We all fight for this money, we know that, but this is just a great way looking forward how we can all get what we need and get along, so I'm excited. So with that, I'll call a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimously. Go spend money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All under the Great process. <laughs> okay, let's see. So um, let me get back on schedule here. We're going to go back down to, uh, back on the calendar to oral communications. This is a part of the meeting. And you can come up and address any item that is uh, related to the uh, RTC that's not on something that's already on the agenda. So if you'd like to come up, you'll be given two minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Gillian Greensight, speaking as an individual member of the public. At your last meeting here, you were talking about um, sort of the buses and putting a GPS in the buses so people would know when the bus came. And I think uh, Commissioner Rockin mentioned that could be expensive. So I started to think between then and now, I'm from Australia, I've been here 44 years, and I took the bus everywhere in Australia, not in Australia, you know, near my hometown. And um, it was simple. You got to a bus stop, you looked up, and the sign told you when the bus would arrive at your stop. It included, it had two columns, AM and PM, and weekdays, weekends, and it gave you the full times of when that bus would arrive at that stop. I, when I came here and I wanted to catch the bus, so I went to the bus stop and I looked up and it, it may as well have been in hieroglyphics. I couldn't understand what it was saying. It didn't tell me when the bus was arriving at my stop and as far as I could figure it out, it told me when it had left somewhere else, which was not of any help whatsoever. So I got a headways, read that again, it was really, incomprehensible for somebody who's used to simple statements. So I'm wondering, instead of spending so much money on GPSs, and not everybody has a smartphone, I'm one of them, um, is, 
what, what would be the difficulty of doing what they do in Australia? And the buses run on time. It's very rare, but it could be a minute or two late, but not usually. But it would seem to me to be a very simple thing, unless there's a reason that it escapes me, and maybe you know, why it couldn't be done. But it seems to me straightforward, user-friendly, and I certainly um, would find it easier to take the bus if I knew when it would arrive at my stop. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't think anybody can explain as much detail as Commissioner Rotkin, so I won't try, but I'll give you the cliff notes. Is that I, I think, uh, you know, the system we're acquiring is an AVL system, which first and form formally will locate the bus. And I think with technology, I don't know that what you're suggesting is out of the question. I don't think we know exactly where it's gonna go, but the start of our system with the AVL will allow us to address iPhones, and if there is something else that they can do, I guarantee you they will be looking into it. So uh, we're not quite up with Australia, but we're trying, okay? Thank you. Can, can, I, can I, I would just add that, that um, uh, we change the headways on a regular basis, and one of the issues with congestion in the county is that buses don't always get to where they're supposed to be because of the traffic, and people have said that they wanna know when the buses are actually gonna be there um, and this uh, uh, technology allows us to, to pinpoint the, uh, the time with greater specificity than what our headways uh, would be able to do. So it, it, we'll still look to have better signage, but this is just another technology. We have gotten a grant that will pay for this, so uh, we, aren't, we aren't giving up service in order to provide uh, this, uh, this new technology. I just wanted to, uh, in, in a way it serves, and I'll just give a quick example um, of sometimes our elderly, they go to uh, a facilities like Social Security and it's raining outside and, and where the station's at, where the bus stops, there is no shelter. So those days where it's either extremely hot or it's, it's extremely windy or extremely cold for these individuals that have to sit out there and wait, I think a service like this would be ideal for them because now they, they can time themselves more or less of when they're gonna exit that building and, and be in a safe shelter and at the same time be able to catch their bus and, and not miss it. Thank you for those comments. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, yeah, I'm, now I'm speaking as part of the community that's um, recovering from the, uh, the vote in January to give the rail corridor away. And or basically to, to block the implementation of a uh, of a greenway, and since then there have been two things that have happened. Uh, one on the statewide level, which is the uh, cancellation of high speed rail, and uh, Gavin Newsom said, and this is a quote: "It costs too much and it takes too long." How long was too long? He said 2033 was too long, and uh, here we are. Uh, keeping a rail corridor for an unfunded train for some very long future when there actually is an alternative that would provide active transportation. In relation to active transportation, uh, down in, uh, in Monterey, um, there, the, uh, the agency down there, Forteg, uh, just received a $10.3 million grant for expansion of the Greenway. Now this happens to be a grant for feeders into their 18 mile rails removed trail in Monterey. But it, what it shows is that there is public money as well as public support for a full Greenway option. And I don't know the legalities, I don't know what the possibilities are of Santa Cruz getting out of this arrangement to prevent a greenway for all these years, but I do hope that something like that does happen because you're gonna find that a tremendous portion of your community, if they're really fully informed about this, is gonna be in favor of getting those rails out of there and giving ourselves this great public asset. Thanks. Thank you for those comments. Uh, good morning, commissioners uh, and staff. Michael Saint from Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, just wanted to take you back a little bit to the 12 nothing vote on the UCIS staff's uh, recommendation, specifically the Ox Lanes project. Uh, sound like a broken record, don't I? Um, I knew it would pass, but I was hoping that there would be at least one or two of you that understood that we were in a climate crisis. 
Um, that widening highways is exactly the opposite of what this RTC should be doing. I will not single out any of you as the culprit for this poor decision because all 12 of you are responsible and you have one twelfth of that responsibility. The Ox Lane project will be your legacy for years to come. You had and still have an opportunity to take us into the 21st century with a modern public transit system, but you chose to take us back to the 1950s when our country decided on an interstate highway system versus a mass transit infrastructure. Global warming is increasing, highway deaths are increasing, owning and operating an automobile is taking this higher percentage of our family income, yet you vote to slap more asphalt on the ground. Uh, frankly, you should be a little ashamed of that decision. You were elected and appointed to this commission to do what is best for the people of this county, to enhance the transportation system, not to spend taxpayer money on temporary fix that will eventually fail. We need more leaders with vision, uh, leaders willing to say no to political pressure when it comes to doing the right thing. Unfortunately, no one stepped up when it was time to vote. And once again, we have politics 12, the citizens and the planet zero. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to come up and address this uh, oral communications? Okay, we'll go ahead and go ahead and close oral communications, and we're gonna get back on schedule here, which I believe takes us to item 19, commissioner reports. Any commissioners have anything to report? Commissioner Brown. Um, I'll just say that the Santa Cruz City Council at its February 12th meeting uh, voted to uh, offer an EcoPass uh, bus pass program. So all downtown workers will now be receiving bus passes in collaboration with the Santa Cruz Metro, and so we're looking forward to that um, coming online and I'll keep you updated about um, the potential increase in ridership as time goes by. Great, great Thanks. program. Any other com Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, when I found out about that uh, pass, I was um, hopeful that uh, Metro would look at uh, giving a pass to people at Metro, uh, excuse me, at Dominican. A lot of people come off of Highway 1 to go to Dominican. Another comment? Okay. All right, that takes on to item 20, uh, director's report, <coughs> Mr. Preston. Thank you, Chair. After a prolonged search, I am pre pleased to announce that the RTC has hired its new director of budget and finance, Tracy New. Tracy comes to the RTC having most recently served as the director of business services and board secretary for the Aptos La Salva Fire Protection District. In that capacity, Tracy was responsible for all services of administration office, including accounting functions. Tracy has a bachelor's of science degree in commerce and finance from Santa Clara University and is a resident of Ben Lomond. Tracy started work on Tuesday, February 19th. Based on her qualifications and her experience, Tracy was hired at step four of a seven class classification series. A special thanks goes out to Daniel Nikuna, who served this role for 26 years. Daniel extended his retirement by three months so the RTC could have more time to find and train his replacement. Daniel will now officially retire on March 28th. The RTC also thanks Mary Jo Walker, the retired auditor controller for Santa Cruz County, who provided professional services to the RTC during this transitional period. Mary Jo is expected to complete her work for the RTC by the end of the month. We, are now, we now have a functional finance department at the RTC due to many changes in staff, and I'm very happy with, uh, with the changes and the, the additions that have been made. Um, excuse me, is Tracy new here in? Yes, oh, and Tracy, my I apologies, to, Tracy is idols, here in, okay. in the audience. And, Thank you for rescuing us, okay? <laughs> and, and is here to uh, address the commission. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Guy, for giving me this opportunity. I look forward to learning everything about transportation, um, and I hope that my budget experience and finance experience will enhance the operations. Thank you. The, the last guy was here tw 28 years, so uh, we look forward to a long career, all right? Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> Uh, the, the next item I have to report on is the leg Legislative Program for Transportation Development Act funding. At the February 7th RTC meeting, the Commission adopted the RTC's federal and state legislative programs. The RTC's state legislative program includes language to oppose efforts that would reduce tr um, Transportation Development Act funds, which are essential for the RTC's administration and planning. 
During a discussion on this item, the Commission directed me to work with the General Manager of Metro to resolve potential conflicts between the respective agencies' legislative programs regarding TDA funds. Specifically, the RTC was concer concerned with a portion of the Metro's legislative program that would seek to cap the off-the-top dollars that are today taken by the RTC, uh, the RTPAs for various line items such as administration, planning, and reserves at 3% maximum. Current legislation has a 3% cap for certain planning and programming functions, but it does not have a cap on administration. Metro originally proposed 3% cap on planning and administration would be a significant decrease in funding for the RTC. Metro and the RTC met on February 21st to discuss the legislative programs regarding TDA funding. Metro agreed to modify its legislative program to resolve this conflict. Metro's revised legislative program does not seek to make changes in the amount that the RTC can use for planning and programming. It only seeks to provide a cap on administration with no percentage specified. Currently, RTC expends approximately 6% on administration. RTC is committed to transparency and fiscal responsibility and is confident that Metro will not advocate for a reduction in TDA funds, which are essential for RTC's administration function functions. Measure D, revenue projections. As part of the vo voter approved Measure D, the RTC allocates, administers, and oversees the expenditure of all measure revenues through an implementation plan. The purposes of the implementation plan are to define the scope, cost, and delivery schedule for each expenditure plan, project, or program, detail the revenue projections and possible financing tools needed to deliver the expenditure plan within the 30-year promise to the voters. As part of this effort, RTC entered into a professional services agreement with Hinder Leader De Lamas and Associates for sale, use, and transportation tax audits and services. HDL provides quarterly reports identifying changes in allocation totals by business groups and categories. Quarterly aberrations due to state audits, fund transfers and receivables along with late or double payments are identified. Data is used to assist the RTC in forecasting Measure D revenue growth for the Measure D implementation plan. On February 19th, HDL briefed RTC staff on their 2018 <coughs> third quarter report. A summary of this report is attached for reference. Although Measure D transportation receipts from July through September were 21.2% above the third quarter sale period in 2017, HDL concluded that actual sales growth was only 2.7% higher in Santa Cruz County due to those significant aberrations in how the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration has been distributing sales tax revenue. HDL further forecasts modest statewide growth of 1.5% in sales tax revenue for fiscal year 1920. RTC staff is considering this growth projection in the preparation of both the Measure D implementation plan and the RTC's fiscal year 1920 budget. Regarding the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Segment 7, Phase 2, at the February 7th RTC meeting, I reported that the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission was scheduled to consider the initial study mitigated neg negative declaration for Phase 2 of Segment 2 of the MBSST and Coastal Rail Trail Spine at its meeting this evening. Phase two of segment seven extends from the intersection of California Street and Bay Street to Pacific Avenue and, and the, at the Santa Cruz Wharf. I have been informed that this consideration has been delayed in part due to public hearings by the RTC on segment five of the MBSST as part of today's meeting. I have not received an update on when this item will move forward, but will keep you posted on inf as information becomes available. Regarding the Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane of Bay, Porter, Bay Avenue, Porter Street to State Park Drive, the RTC is working with Caltrans on a cooperative funding agreement to be implementing agency on preliminary engineering and an environmental document for the next two sets of Highway 1 aux lanes. Currently, staff is preparing a request for proposals for a consulting firm to provide the necessary professional services to perform this work. Staff anticipates funding this work in part through a $1.83 million STIP funds, which has been programmed by the CTC. This project is also eligible for Measure D Highway Corridor funding. 
when staff completes the scope of work, advertises an RFP, selects a firm, and negotiates the terms of a proposed agreement with the most qualified firm, staff will bring a proposed contract to the commission for consideration, <coughs> likely at the August RTC meeting. Regarding the next B&A committee meeting date, please be advised that the March budget and administration uh, committee meeting date time has changed. The next B&A committee will meet on Thursday, March 21st at 9 a.m. And for this last item, I'm going to go to the front podium to um, do a, 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 an appreciation to uh, an employee who has 25 years of service with the RTC. Today we recognize, that's not gonna work, I'll just speak loud. He's got it, he's helping you. <laughs> Today we recognize that Luis, Luis Mendez for his 25 years and six days of dedicated service to the RTC. Luis is the longest tenured member of the RTC staff and serves as my deputy director. Luis is a wealth of knowledge and his experience is invaluable to the RTC. A resolution, a resolution honoring Luis is in front of you here and I present it to Luis with sincere appreciation. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, when I uh, interviewed for the, for the position of Transportation Planner 1, I was asked what sort of a commitment I intended to make to the agency. <laughs> I, I said about two to three years. I was <laughs> extremely wrong about that. Um, but that's mainly because it's, I mean, working uh, for this agency and at, for this community has just been an extreme pleasure. Um, it's, um, d it's great to work with a staff that's so dedicated and professional, uh, to work with commissioners that are just as, de as dedicated and very caring about the community uh, that they serve and are looking to make sure that what the decisions they make are, are decisions that are, you know, in the best interest of the entire community. And it's also great to work with uh, partner agencies that, you know, work so collaboratively with, uh, with each other and with, the, and with the RTC to come to um, solutions about the things that we need that, uh, again, benefit the community as a whole and the work that everyone is doing. And, and of course, we would not be able to do the work that we do without the great engagement of the community. We do have a very uh, informed community that gets very engaged in what we do, and that you know, it is, is a very important part of the democratic process that, that, that we are a part of to make sure that we serve the community as, as well as, as we can. So I feel extremely fortunate and blessed to have the opportunity to be serve this community for as long as I have, and I certainly hope that I can continue to do that for many years to come. Thank you. That was good. Thank you. Uh, Chair, uh, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Mendez for his uh, excellent service. He's unflappable, and we've thrown him some curveballs <laughs> over time, and when we acquired this rail line, it became his responsibility to learn all things rail, and he's been an excellent resource, uh, along with all the other work that he does, and I just want to express my appreciation for his long service to this commission. Well said. Any other comments? Thank you, Luis, for your good. For Okay, that will accept that report. We'll move on to, uh, yes, sir. I, I wanna make a comment on the director's report. I think Go it's ahead. related, thank you. I actually have a slide. Um, can you stop the clock until the slides come up? Can you? Congratulations, Louise, by the way. Um, just to give you the context here, what um, we're showing is the draft slides for the director's visit to the California Transportation Commission. Um, and um, Trail Now, Representatives Trail Now, Santa Cruz Greenway, and other concerned citizens are gonna be attending that. Um, this is just the draft slide package where we're gonna go through some of the history of the train and the decisions made on the coastal corridor, and that's the subject item. Um, basically, uh, one of our main emphasis is you're gonna be destroying the historical trestles. Um, 
passenger train from the, uni from the Unified Corridor study showed it was not an effective solution. There's a lot of uh, public opposition to the train, Measure L. Um, 20 years, the Coastal Corridor is going to be sitting vacant. 20 years. It's already sat almost 10. Um, and active transportation is five times, from the study, five times more effective than a train or even a bus. So if you just go through the next slides, and I'm, again, I'm just going to roll through them. You know, the trestles, that I commented about the historical value. You're not going to be out. In order for you to have 60 trains a day going 45 miles an hour, every one of those trestles is going to be destroyed. They're going to put concrete tr trestles in. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to do it. Uh, the study showed that it, it wasn't affordable. Next slide. Uh, you have a lot of backlash. Next slide. Hey, it's running along the coast. I mean, you, you talk about climate change. It's going to wash away. Next slide. Uh, expensive. You're spending $1.6 million to maintain this. You've given away $15 million for an excursion train. Next slide. Excursion trains. Next slide. I won't even go there. This is the truth. This is how wide it is. Next slide. That's by O'Neill's. Next slide. Look, it's going right through 38th Avenue. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate them. Okay, with that, we'll accept the director's report. We'll move on to item 21, Caltrans report. Ms. Lowe. Morning, Mr. Chair and commissioners. Uh, first, I'd like to just call your attention to an uh, outreach event hosted by Caltrans as part of the Division of Local Assistance Program, and that is on safety. The strategic California Strategic Highway Safety Plan includes the development um, and outreach of a program called California Safe Roads. There are six outreach events around the state. The one that would that would uh, be closest to the Santa Cruz area will be held on April 11th in Oakland, and at this time you'd anyone coming would be asked to help uh, identify key strategies that would have the greatest potential to save lives and prevent serious injuries on all California roadways. And then I would like to report on the progress that we're making with the revenue sources afforded by SB1. In one year's time, Caltrans has completed 50 projects um, in addition to the normal, um, normal work effort. And we have also been able to get a, another 100 projects under contract or under construction. That's just on the state highway system. Of course, we see the same level of commitment by local agencies and our transportation agencies around the state. In addition to our efforts to fix it first and, and uh, take good care of the inf existing infrastructure, Senate Bill 1, the Road Repair and Accountability Act of, of 2017, also requires Caltrans to find $100 million in efficiencies every year. This year, we not only met that target, but we beat it. Uh, we found $133 million in efficiencies. And the areas that we did this in uh, included um, acceleration of projects, streamlining environmental review, conducting value analysis on studies on uh, high, high cost projects, and innovating the use of contracting methodologies, contracting design. Uh, CMGC is a, is a term that's commonly used. This is an innovation that, is, that differs from the traditional design bid build process and allows us to hire contractors much earlier. So that's a very aggressive ask, but it's our uh, responsibility to the taxpayer. As, as SB1 brings new revenue in, we're also um, serious about making these efficiencies. And then you have a report on, on the projects in the county that are underway and under construction. If you have any questions, I'm uh, available to answer. Do, I, I have a question. Yeah, I have a, a, a oh, yeah, In regards to the project that's on the shop project uh, 18, a4, oh no, sorry, at 18A5, um, which is the um, project identifier I1G 160, which is the Santa Cruz County on the routes 1, Highway 1, Highway 9, 17, 129, 152, and says various locations install accessible pedestrian signage mm -hmm. signals. Mm -hmm. is, is that part of the, our, what we call our merchant uh, East Beach Street intersection? Signal lights for our students. Uh, let's see. I'm 
I'm looking at uh, project number 22 on this list, and that does have the Marchant Street one listed, if that's the same one, 1G. Uh, well, on, this, on this program funded shop projects, it's uh, Santa Cruz County, January 20, it's a program for 1819. Oh, we might be looking at different reports. Um, yeah, you're looking at your other one, which yeah, is Yeah, but is there is back. one, we, we do have. I'm looking at your shop, the mm -hmm. shop projects. Yeah. Eight, page eight, 18A5. I where it says uh, I was looking program at funded way. shops projects. We I got two two different types of shop project reports. Yes, sorry about so that. So that's why it's kind of confusing, <laughs> and that's why I kind of want a clarification. Because okay. okay. one says one says eighteen nineteen, and the other one pushes it to twenty one okay. twenty two. I think. Let me see if I can get it here. Real and, quick. and I prefer it to occur in eighteen nineteen. So this is um, agenda item eighteen. Is what you're looking at? Mm hmm. Agenda item 18A-5. Yeah. And, and here it, it has it programmed for 1819. And then it, it got, and of course, the one you were referring to on 22 item. MG160. I, that should be the same one. It's. Um, the programming year, okay, I see what that is. The programming year and the construction year are not the same. So these are the same, these are the same projects. So the, uh, the programming, so that project, and I apologize, we'll, we'll, we'll try to merge these. I can see how Efficiency confusing this is. Yes, yes uh, sorry about that. <coughs> so the project that you're referencing on page 18A-5 is the same as uh, project, uh, project number two, 22 on this mm -hmm. report. Yeah. The, the, cons the anticipated construction is the fall of 2020. The programming year is when, when we lock in the funds to deliver the project. So it's, so 1819 is the year the project was programmed and it's anticipated construction in 2020. That's not a slip, that's just a different milestone. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah because uh, we just were under the impression that it was gonna be, they were gonna be installed this year. No, the, the the programming year is um, still coming up. Okay. In the in the excuse me, we're in the eighteen nineteen fiscal year. It's programmed this year for construction in twenty twenty. Good, thank you. Yeah. I know it's a. Scenario. Probably in that same vein, uh, to find out a timeline for the the Wagner. Uh, I guess uh, the, the project is one e zero two zero. Yes. Is yes, your that. On? Oh, did your mic? Sorry. Yeah, that c construction um, contract has, was approved in December, so we should be seeing c construction activity out there this spring. Oh, so probably like June or? Oh, well, the contract has been awarded. Uh, I'll have to get back and see what the, usually the contractor has to come up with his own schedule that meets the deadlines in our contract, and very often there can be uh, wi uh, weather delays and things like that, but I'll, we'll make sure that we're more clear in the next report. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And a question to Ms. Lowe. I just wanna say thank you very much to Ms. Lowe for her focus on Watsonville. We had three state highways bisecting the city and, uh, and we appreciate your focus. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone from the public have a comment on the uh, Caltrans report? Okay, thank you, we'll accept that report. Ms. Lowe, appreciate that. Move on to item 22. There are a, uh, y yes, uh, Go Mr. Ahead. Chair, um, this is, uh, the, the RTC has one commissioner committee, that's the Budget Administration Personnel Committee, and every year uh, the uh, RTC goes through a process of reappointing or uh, existing members or appointing new members to the, to the committee. So this, this is the time now when uh, nominations, uh, uh, it's nomination time for the for that committee. So any m members of the committee that, that are currently uh, serving can uh, provide their interest in continuing to serve you to the chair or to the executive director by March 15th, uh, which is a week from tomorrow, um, or any new, any members who are not on the committee and wish to uh, be part of the committee also uh, can do that. And so that, and that committee is, uh, uh, is responsible for, you know, the, uh, as stated in the uh, rules and regulations, uh, to review and monitor issues relating to the budget uh, work program and other administrative functions of the commission and makes recommendations to the commission and also serves as the personnel committee to review personnel matters and, and so on. 
Um, it, uh, it states that uh, the chair will serve on the committee and up to five um, uh, commissioners. So it can be a total of up to six. Over the years, it's, it's varied between, between four and, and six members uh, on the uh, committee. Currently, the, currently, there are five members, and the committee um, tends to meet every other month. And sometimes if, you know, if there are items for, the, for an agenda, then the meetings will get canceled or sometimes meetings added if necessary. So with that, I just urge everyone to provide your, you know, your interest to the chair or the, uh, or the executive director by March 15th. Great. Well, I think we can go ahead and uh, deal with this to, uh, now. I, I've got uh, comments from uh, three people so far. I've, uh, uh, Commissioner Bertrand wants to uh, remain on the committee, Commissioner Leopold, uh, and uh, Commissioner Caput has uh, shown an interest to be on the committee. So I just need to know if uh, Commissioner Coonerty doesn't have an alternative here. So maybe that's going to freeze me for now. Commissioner Friend, still interested in being on the committee, and Commissioner McPherson? Yes. Okay. So with that, um, you know, there is a meeting on the 21st. It's, um, it's, it's hard to believe that Commissioner Coonerty's alternate, uh, Mr. Schifrin, is not interested in being on that committee. Well, I, <laughs> I did see him in the room, but it was a cameo appearance, so he yeah, left. No, but, but he's but, an active member. Yeah, of the what, what, I, what I've been inclined to do on this is uh, the, the existing board had five members, and we've had anywhere from four to six on this. And so with the request of uh, Commissioner Caput, uh, it allows the chair to be on the committee, which I don't really have an interest to be on the committee. So what I'm going to do is add uh, Commissioner Caput to this committee, keep the other five intact, and that will be the new committee for 2019. And your first meeting is on the 21st. If, so. if, if that is uh, your appointment, Mr. Chair, it does uh, require concurrence by the commission, so motion to concur. And so move. Second. Motion, a se motion by uh, Leopold, second by Bertrand. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you for that unanimous support. Okay, that takes us to um, <laughs> item 24. We have a uh, Santa Cruz Public Works yeah, update. <laughs> Mr. Machado. I need the appropriate rejoiner every now and then. All right, good morning, Chair, Commissioners. My name is Matt Machado. I'm the uh, Director of Public Works for Santa Cruz County. Yep, it's on. And I'm also one of the uh, Deputy CAOs. Uh, the item I have before you this morning is a brief presentation on the county's effort to operationalize our strategic plan. So that's a bit different than what's in your agenda. It's much broader than just a public works update, but I will focus on reliable transportation. So bear with me. And I know you've had a long day, so I will keep the pace moving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you. Let me, let me see here. Page up, page up. Okay. All right. So we will begin. Uh, I'm going to start by providing a brief overview of the county's strategic plan. Uh, then I'll provide an update on the operational planning process and an overview of the operational plan elements. The operational plan will be comprised of countywide strategies, so I will review their framework and development with you today. And then finally, I'll uh, discuss next steps and give you an opportunity to comment. Our strategic plan was a result of a year-long effort. We engaged with thousands of county residents and staff to develop our vision, mission, and values. You see those here, as well as developing six focus areas and related goals. Here are those six focus areas. I will note that, uh, that these plan elements are online. They are at sccvision.us for more detail. This diagram shows the hierarchy of strategic of our strategic plan and operational plan elements. The strategic plan serves as our north star by providing a vision of the future. The operational plan will provide our approach for strategic plan implementation. The first two-year operational plan will establish a countywide strategy uh, with department objectives and key steps for achieving the 24 strategic plan goals. This will be an important step in changing county culture and collaborating with departments to achieve the vision of the strategic plan. This is a chart showing the input we've taken over the past year uh, with development of the strategic plan. It results in the department objectives, which are most recent. We created 180 department objectives. That is truly the implementation of the strategic plan that will result in actions. Okay. 
Department collaboration is a priority. As you can see, we worked closely together, all of our departments. Their graphic here shows connections between departments based on their draft objectives. So the wider the line, the more related the departments are. And so looking at, say, public works as an example, there's a very wide line that connects to planning. We are, we are together in most items. <clears throat> we are also working on embedding our county values in our strategies. Based on the work of the steering committee, operational plan development is being guided by the principle of equity. This equity is really the relationship between our strategies and objectives uh, to represent our values. The values are listed here, and from our perspective, the county provides services and supports partnerships built on those values that you see here in the chart. For today's meeting, we did provide a handout, it's at the back of the room, of all 54 draft strategies. And as mentioned previously, the strategy statements describe the county's approach in achieving our strategic plan goals. All of the strategies follow the same format, which is shown here, which is, we will act to have an impact. Next, I will discuss the strategy development for reliable transportation, which is probably most relative to this commission. And here we are. <clears throat> so under reliable transportation, our subcommittee was composed of representatives from public works, planning, economic development, human services, health services, and the CAO. The strategy we are highlighting today is within the goal of regional mobility. Additionally, our three other goals in reliable transportation included community mobility, local roads, and public transit, all items that I know your commission are interested in. Uh, yet today I just provide this one example. The major theme that emerged in our discussions of regional mobility was the burden on South County commuters to economic centers in the north and over the hill. The strategy here speaks to partnership, partnering with agencies such as the RTC to increase options and decrease, and decrease strain on commuters. Some of the projects or initiatives identified to support this strategy are level of service improvements, specifically around, say, Soquel Avenue at 41st, transportation planning, and looking at options within the county that reduce overall traffic, such as opening additional office space in South County. We're almost there. I told you, quick pace. We're gonna keep it rolling. So next steps. So we have presented all draft strategies to the Board of Supervisors and are now asking this body to consider them. In particular, we would like to know what you find useful or important among the strategies. Additionally, we would like to know what gaps or questions present themselves. And finally, it is important to reiterate that this operational plan is the first step in a long-term vision to change the county culture. We value your input and ask for patience in terms of seeing any particular feedback materialized in this first plan. In addition to presenting to various commissions and boards, we will have two additional venues for community engagement. Focus groups with subject matter experts are being scheduled at the end of March, and the county will host three community open houses in April. The open houses will be held in North, Mid, and South County locations. <clears throat> Any feedback that does not come out in today's discussions can be emailed to our CAO at vision at santacruzcounty.us, and I certainly can take any questions you may have today or record any comments you have. Any questions for Mr. Machado? <clears throat> you made it before noon, good job, thank you. <laughs> just a comment, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I just wanna thank Mr. Machado for his uh, focus on South County. You know, it only took an hour today to uh, go 16 miles and so I think the, the commuters in uh, South County are ready for some kind of relief one way or another.
Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for those comments, and thank you for that presentation. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, takes us to our next item, which is the adjourn the meeting. I just want to announce that our next meeting will be Thursday, April 4th at 9 a.m. in Watsonville. So uh, we look forward to going down there for a visit. And with that, we are adjourned. Yeah. Oh, uh,